Good evening, and welcome to this meeting of the Boston School Committee. I'm Chairperson Jerry Robinson. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to welcome everyone who is joining us tonight in person on Boston City TV and on Zoom. I'm going to ask everyone here in the chamber to please turn off the volume on your laptops or other devices so it does not interfere with the audio for tonight's meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. Tonight's meeting documents are posted on the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org slash school committee under the October 4th meeting link. For those joining us in person, you can access the meeting documents by scanning the QR code that's posted by the doors. The meeting documents have been translated into all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The meeting will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and on YouTube. The recording will be available in all of the BPS languages. The committee is pleased to offer live, simultaneous interpretation virtually in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdiano, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and American Sign Language. The Zoom interpretation feature has been activated. Zoom participants should click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to select your language preference. I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. We will begin with the approval of minutes. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the September 27th, 2023 School Committee meeting as present, presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Is there any objection to approving the motion by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Mary Skipper. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Robinson, and good evening. <clears throat> Last night, uh, I'm going to start with uh, our facilities conditions assessment and to just share that Last night, the BPS Facilities Condition Assessment, which we call the FCA, this dashboard went live. It's now accessible to the public, and it can be found at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash all lowercase FCA. The FCA is one important tool that we will use to inform the long-term facilities plan, which is scheduled to be released in December. The FCA includes two things. One a detailed report of building conditions, cost estimates, and recommendations for improvements and modernization, and two, an Americans with Disabilities Act compliance and accessibility report, which will be finalized later this month. We will use the FCA data to help determine building infrastructure needs, and as part of the rubric, the data will help inform future decisions on projects or other capital investments. The data confirms what we already know. Our buildings are safe, but many are in terrible condition. Replacing or updating all of the building systems across our aging facilities would cost billions of dollars every year. I want to take a moment and assure our families and staff that our buildings are safe. We have very strict protocols in place for health and safety. And when there is a health or safety emergency in any one of our buildings, the BPS facilities team takes immediate action. All of the items listed in the FCA, from boilers to roofs, need to be addressed with a sense of urgency. However, there is no school that needs to be taken offline immediately because of the building's condition. I think we all agree that our kids deserve much more, and these results underscore how decade after decade of delayed decisions and divestment brought us to where we are. 
We can't change the past, but we can and will move forward in partnership with the city. We will give our children inspiring, state-of-the-art spaces for them to learn and grow. For the immediate future, we have linked the FCA dashboard to what we call the Asset Essentials Work Order System. This is our internal maintenance and repair tracking system. This will allow the dashboard to regularly be updated as we make improvements and repairs to the facilities. The FCA is an incredible tool for us to inform necessary repairs and investments. But as I said at the beginning, it is only one tool that we are using to inform our long-term facilities plan. This will not be the only data we use to make decisions about the future of our buildings. This work won't be easy, but it requires everyone to understand the scope of the problem we face, and we must use the FCA data as part of our rubric to make decisions about what buildings to take offline, what schools should merge, where should we renovate, and where should we build new. There's a lot of work to do, and in November, the capital planning team will be back for an update to the committee about the rubric and the development of the long-term facilities plan. I want to thank the operations team, especially Teresa and F. Webster and Brittany Silva, for all of their work over the past two years to get us to the place where we can understand the condition and needs of each particular building in real time. This is truly a game changer for our district. <clears throat> I also want to provide a brief update on the Rec O'Brien. <clears throat> Last Saturday, September 30th, more than 80 people attended an open house event for O'Brien students and families, which was held at the West Roxbury Educational Complex. It was an opportunity for families to tour the building and to explore the campus and outdoor athletic facilities. It was also a chance for the BPS Capital Planning Team to hear the community's ideas around the space, which will be designed for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We've heard all sorts of great ideas, like building a robotics lab, a fabrication lab, and other science, technology, and engineering spaces. Other suggestions included building a new home for the O'Brien TV station, creating outdoor spaces for students to eat lunch, and making sure the gym has enough seating to welcome spectators for games. This will be a full gut renovation of the building. So it's an opportunity to completely redesign and reimagine and build a world-class STEM high school. I want the school committee members and families to know that we are listening and we hear the concerns around transportation, moving the location of the school, and the need for further planning for our high schools. On transportation, at the open house, we shared a commitment to direct shuttles or to provide direct shuttles from across the city, and we provided some analysis of the estimated travel times from different neighborhoods. The full report is posted on our website and can be found at boston.gov forward slash all lowercase WREC. We know this remains a significant concern for many families. We're encouraged by the estimated travel times that we're seeing for students, generally 40 minute commute, which is comparable to the commute for many high schools across the city. We'll continue to engage the community for further feedback and we're absolutely committed to making sure that all students have access to the O'Brien. We also hear the concerns around the proposed location change of the O'Brien in West Roxbury. We've heard the feedback about considering other city-owned sites like the Timulty Building, the Boston Water and Sewers Lots, and the Campbell Resource Center. We asked the city's public facilities department to conduct an initial feasibility of these locations which are also publicly available online at the same site. The locations that have been mentioned do have some limitations, from insufficient parcel size to a lack of access to athletic facilities. These would prevent us from delivering on the student experience as defined by the broader BPS community process over the past several months. <clears throat> I've always been the type of leader who believes good ideas can be made better with input. 
and input from many stakeholders. And in this case, we're actively listening to all the ideas and suggestions. We'll keep this committee updated as we continue conversations with families and come back with a more detailed and formal update later this school year. Now an update on exam schools. There was a request to discuss the exam schools at tonight's meeting, so I want to provide the school committee and the public with a few updates to frame that discussion. First, I want to acknowledge the feelings and experiences of some of our families around exam school admissions. This can be an emotional topic for families because it affects the future for their children. After the first full year of in the implementation of the new policy, which is this school year, we are seeing more geographical, racial, and socioeconomic diversity in our exam school in student invitations. This is promising early data that indicates that the policy is working, but we don't know the full impact yet because we don't have multiple years of data to tell the whole story. The one year of complete data we do have is revealing impacts that this committee, the public, and my own team have raised as concerns that we need to understand further. There are several big areas that we've heard about and see in the data. First, 10 points. There are concerns around the addition of 10 points to student scores because they attend a school that serves 40% economically disadvantaged students or higher. Questions have been raised about whether that penalizes individual students who attend schools that do not qualify for the additional points, particularly in tiers six, seven, and eight. Also, choosing schools and 10 points. There are concerns that students at the seven BPS schools that do not meet the threshold to receive the 10 points will not gain admission to an exam school, leading other families not to choose those schools in the future. There are concerns that if a student receives a perfect composite score and does not receive the 10 points, they are not able to get their first choice of exam school, especially in tiers seven and eight. And there's questions around the equal distribution of seats. We've heard concerns that the equal distribution of seats in each tier is problematic, wanting us to do a percentage of seats per tier instead. Although I wasn't here as superintendent when the policy was approved, I know the process to create and pass our current admissions policy was difficult and intense at times. The process to bring a new recommendation forward was led by the exam school's admissions task force. The task force held public hearings over five months, reviewed years worth of admissions data, and listened to community input at dozens of public meetings. I respect that process and the hard work it took to get us here. In order for me to bring forward any recommendations to change or amend the current policy, we need more data to understand if something is an anomaly or a trend that needs to be addressed. As policymakers, we must rely on sufficient data to understand a policy decision's impact. This body is focused on student outcomes and understanding the impact our policies and practices have on students. That is why the policy, as was voted, calls for a full review after five years. I do believe that once we are able to get a second year of invitation and student data, we will have the information to identify potential trends related to the concerns raised earlier or to other things that emerge. My team and I understand the concerns raised and I've asked them to continue to monitor and analyze both the invitation and student outcome data. We'll update the committee at the end of this school year with the invitation data for SY 24-25 and then provide another update in the early fall with student outcomes. Once we have this information, we will determine any needed next steps. How are the students admitted under the new policy doing? It's too soon to say because they started school last month. But what I can share is that some of the initial data we collected during school years 21 and 22 and 22 and 23, <clears throat> while we cannot provide year over year comparisons for the temporary policies enacted during the pandemic, we do have some idea of how the change from the former policy has impacted student outcomes. In this slide, looking at chronic absenteeism rates, 
We know rates across all schools have gone up during the pandemic. What we see from this slide is that the chronic absenteeism rates in exam schools were approximately half that of chronic absenteeism rates for the full district. We'll hear more about the MCAS and accountability data for the district in a report later, but I also wanted to highlight the most recent student growth data for the exam schools from MCAS. As you may remember, student growth percentile, or what we call SGP, looks at how student academic performance has grown from year to year. A typical growth score falls between 40 and 60, indicating students are making growth at a rate comparable to their peers across the state. This slide shows that for grades seven and eight in both ELA and math, all three exam schools have growth scores in the typical range. The O'Brien has high growth in math in grades seven and eight. This is high level data and my team will continue to dig into the data as we look to better understand the impact of this policy on student outcomes. And lastly, I wanna make sure that all families know that BPS will hold two virtual information sessions regarding the upcoming exam schools 24-25 admissions process. And these will take place on Thursday, October 12th and November 2nd, both at 6 p.m. If you're interested, I urge you to attend you can find the link to those meetings and more information about the admissions process at our bostonpublicschools.org lower uh, forward slash lower exam. I also encourage the families to explore some of our other BPS high schools because there are incredible BPS high schools that provide our students with college preparatory curriculum, early college and career pathways, sports and clubs, arts programming, urban planning, and green design and a variety of trade programming, and so, so much more. I'm gonna to turn to SIP requirements. Um, first of all, just as a reminder, SIP is our systemic improvement plan that we have with the state. First, we submitted the district's inclusive education plan, the district's roadmap for meeting its obligation to provide the least restrictive environment for students with disabilities. The plan focuses on several key areas that address both day-to-day -day work the district must shift to and the larger systems work that are needed to support this and hold us accountable. We look forward to a full presentation on the plan in a couple of weeks at school committee on October 18th. I just wanna give a big shout out to the entire special education. This was really a cross-functional team that worked on this, our OMME team as well as our schools team. It was really a, a true labor of love to get this plan created because of what it holds for promise to our students ahead. <coughs> Secondly, we submitted revisions to the strategic plan for the BPS Office of Multilingual and Multicultural Education. As you know, the OMME strategic plan was finalized a year ago in the fall of 2022. Since then, BPS convened and met with stakeholders to consider the plan. We incorporated their feedback while also aligning the OMME strategic plan with the inclusive education plan. You can find these documents posted on our website at www.bostonpublicschools.org forward slash capital strategic, capital progress, and we've posted the plans on our website. A few bright spots um, as I close my report out, many, many bright spots in the first several weeks of school. Uh, on Monday, October 2nd, BPS recognized National Custodian Appreciation Day for 2023. I'd like to take a moment to honor the hard work of the BPS team of approximately 500 custodians who, although they work mostly behind the scenes, they make sure our buildings and our schools are welcoming, clean, and safe. This So we might as well uh, ask Mike and Andrew to just step forward, just as, as representation for our custodians. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. I'd also like to recognize that um, BPS new teacher developer Cynthia Rivas-Mendez and Ricardo Perez 
who is a SLIFE teacher at East Boston High School, are being honored by Latinos in Education. This is a national advocacy organization that supports access to equitable education for Latinx students. Cynthia and Ricardo will be honored at the State of Education 2023 event and will join educators, nonprofit leaders, and other officials at the event which is being held during Hispanic Heritage Month. It's also BPS College and Career Month. On Friday, September 26th, 29th, we kicked the month off with Citywide College Pride Day. The employees wore their college swag to work. For me, it was Tufts, which is Go Jumbos. Um, please join us at the BPS Citywide College Career and STEM Fair on Saturday, October 21st from 10 until 1.30 p.m. at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center. This event, uh, which is really one of our highlights, will include more than 170 higher education institutions, employers, career agencies, programs, as well as interactive STEM opportunities and personalized college financial aid advising sessions. All BPS students and families are invited to attend. <clears throat> In closing, um, as I, as I uh, turn it back to you, Chair, I just want to share that we did provide an update to the Shaw and Taylor school communities on the process for their merger. The design team took a break this summer, but we'll be meeting again soon to discuss grade configurations, school leadership process, and other topics as they plan for the merger at the end of the school year. We will then host a larger community meeting once the design team meets. This concludes my report. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I'll open it up to questions and discussions from the committee. I'd like to remind my colleagues about our agreed upon norm that we each have five minutes, one to two questions. And um, also like to remind BPS staff to please be brief in your responses. Okay. And I now have a little five minute timer here so I can wave at you. Thank you. Um, which way do you want to begin? I'm happy to start. Go for it. Um, I'll s I have questions about the FCA and the O'Brien, but I'm going to start with exam schools because I was the person who requested the conversation. Um, I want to actually get to the point, but I will just say, for me, this feels frustrating on a, a million levels and feels like bureaucracy at its best. <laughs> Excuse like me. We know. Could you please get closer to the mic? Thank you. Check, check. It feels like bureaucracy at its best. We can look at the data. We know there are problems. And we're sitting here in front of the public saying, let's wait and see how bad this could get. Because we know it was literally impossible for a tier seven zero point applicant to be admitted to BLS, as the cutoff was 100.2. So literally an unattainable score. So if you're a poor student who goes to one of those seven schools, you could not get in. The policy didn't work. And we can wait another year to, I don't know, buy ourselves time, but like what a dereliction of responsibility. It feels like we can do two things. We can have sober conversations of a policy that clearly isn't working when an entire category of people are ruled out of access to it. And we can continue to update a policy. I, it just sort of blows my mind. And then on some level, because I've been asking to have the conversation for five months, it also doesn't. Because we're here five months later, where every single meeting I've been to over the last five months, I've asked for this to be an agenda item. So I'm frustrated, and I'm sad for working class families who are going to one of those seven schools and don't get this benefit. It's a bad policy. It's a bad policy. And we know it, the data's in front of us. So I'm gonna ask some questions. What is the, what is the goal of the points? Um, so through you, Chair. So um, this was a pretty extensive process, as I indicated, with a committee that um, put this into place for lots of reasons relative to the tiering and the points. The overall goal was to make sure from a socioeconomic standpoint we were diversifying our exam schools. I think that there was compelling data to say that, particularly in the case of BLS, that really uh, nothing was moving and that there were lots of students who were being not able to really access it. Um, I will ask, uh, there's, two, there's two people that were intimate to the policy because I wasn't here when it was created. Um, and so I will just ask Monica Hogan 
Maple Clarkson to come up because I think if you have technical questions in particular, it'd be good for them to be able to answer. So, but we're acknowledging the point, the goal of the points, and I can't see the time that I have left, but we're acknowledging the, the goal of the points was to help diversify the schools. Why, my understanding, I also wasn't here for this, was that there was a proposal that was given to us, and in the ninth inning, or the ninth hour, I am the last person who should ever do a sports reference, that that policy then was changed by the acting superintendent at the time. Was there changes from the recommendations from the committee by the superintendent? So the original policy proposal that the superintendent presented to the school committee at the end of June in 2021 um, had additional 10 points for schools that had 50% or more economically disadvantaged students. So, so at some point we decided we, as a community, we could change, we could do something different than the initial recommendation. I just want to make sure that like that recommendation wasn't Bible and I'm stepping on toes. So the, based on feedback heard um, in the engagement sessions, the superintendent at the time, um, the, the recommendation that was brought forth for a vote before this body was uh, the 40% rule um, that was done to align with the cutoff for Title I school-wide versus targeted programming. And then the, the question, again, I don't know how much time I have. Oh, I have a little bit. 46 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told that the reason we are unable to give income-eligible students poor families points directly and that we are offering those 10 bonus points to wealthy families who go to school with higher concentrations of poor kids is because we're not able to localize that data. Is that correct? So this came up in the task force conversations that were all held um, on Zoom through open meeting law. Um, there was back and forth. There were members of the task force that were interested in points for individual students based on individual status. There were task force members who were not interested in that, and they did not think that asking individual families to produce information about their income as part of the application process was something that they wanted to put forward, nor did they think that it was something that would be sustainable and like, they felt that it would be more of a barrier, I believe, um, for families in part of the application process. And so the, the way that the points based on where you went to school came from was trying to understand um, the amount of resources that a school might have and how is that tied to the percentage of economically disadvantaged students who attend that school. But then how would we know the percentage of economically disadvantaged students who attend the school if we don't? if we are not able to assign points to that particular student. So Massachusetts participates in um, Free Lunch Boston as a community eligibility provision district, and I believe that's actually now statewide. Um, I don't know that for sure. Um, yeah. Um, and so what that means is that once students are enrolled, um, we do state reporting to the state on student enrollment every night. Um, so the state looks to see who's enrolled in our district and they take that information and they match it against information that they get from the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. So once the students are enrolled, we're able to understand who participates in those programs. Through the application process for exam schools, those students are not yet enrolled with Boston and so we do not have that validation process with the state until they have actually enrolled in our schools. And Monica, just to be clear, there are groups of students that are left out of that process. Correct. These, the only students who are counted in that process are students who are participating in state programs. Um, SNAP, the, ooh, I can't remember all the acronyms, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which I believe now has a new name, um, Medicaid, MassHealth, um, we can get you the full list of who's counted in that. So, but it then begs the question that like, it isn't then, truly reliable data around economic disadvantage if there are students left out of the count? It's, it's the best available measure that we have. It, it used to be that uh, schools would keep localized data on this in the, for, you know, for free and reduced lunch. When things moved to universal, the state moved to a direct certification process in this. 
but in that process, there are groups of students that are left out of that. So to Monica's point, it is the, the best and the only mechanism. There are, just as a reminder, also 30% uh, of the students who are applying uh, for exam schools come from outside of PPS. And so, again, we don't have that level of data because we don't have that relationship with the state. So I think it's this, and I think it's also, um, you know, that, that there is more likelihood we would leave students out, like larger groups of students out, if we were to try to do it at an individual level. I know that I'm yeah. out of time. I will. One question, and then we'll come back around. Perfect. Oh, ask it. Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm going to go back and then we'll come back to you. You were okay. still looking at me. I wasn't sure what we okay. were doing. <laughs> You'll get a chance to ask the next question. Go ahead. I actually want to continue the thread of the conversation, so I'm, I'm willing to yield my time just so we can continue the thought. I don't want to have to revisit it. So. No, we can, if, if you want to continue. I'm saying I would like to continue with the current <laughs> okay. conversation, yes. Go ahead. I hear this argument or that there are students, which is real, who are left out of the 10 points in general, right? Like I could be a family living in public housing in Boston and I get a scholarship to a private school and I leave the system. It doesn't change my economic disadvantage, but I won't have access to that school. Yet a student whose family could own a home in Boston <laughs> would get 10 points by going to a school with a higher concentration of poor kids. I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm crazy. It sounds wild. It sounds wild to me that that's where we are. And what's even more wild is when we see what that means on all the charts that we all put together all the time, that we are going to punt for another year, which I don't, I don't even believe we'll have a, policy change in a year. I think it'll, like, it'll just keep punting. But we're going to keep on punting because it sounds tough. The fight for this would be completely different if families also felt like they had higher quality options. And so like two things have to be true. We have to reconcile, well, like, this is anno an annoying conversation about a tiny number of schools and a tiny number of seats that's deepened by the fact that families feel really hopeless. And if we're committed to diversity, and if we're committed to equity in that program, we have to look at a policy that's not getting, not doing the thing we're saying, and actually truly excluding poor families who have been able to get into these six or seven schools that have higher concentrations or have lower concentrations of poverty. I feel like, a, as a school committee member, like I'm I don't know what else to do on this. Like, I don't know how you push a policy conversation when we're unwilling to do it. I don't know if it's about raising it for a vote. I don't, like, I want this to die so it also gets out of my head because I feel like just being like, we'll wait another year is just like not how, it's just like not how I work. And so I, I, I guess it's a question for the chair. Like, I don't know what we do next. Like, I'm at an impasse as a committee member. I don't, I can't accept that answer to just like, we'll see what happens next year. Like that doesn't feel good for me. And I think there are solutions that may get us an answer. As a school committee, we may not get there. But I think like not bringing a policy, over five months of asking for this, not bringing a policy to the table, not bringing a vote to the table, I just don't know what else to do here. And I'm, you, we had a conversation today, like I'm very frustrated by this. And I'm frustrated by like our inability to move over five months. Uh, through you, Chair, may I? Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, obviously can't answer that part uh, for ch with Chair, but um, what I can say is that uh, first off, I think there was a reason why the initial committee and the policy recommended five years. Maybe five years was too much, but I think that the, the goal was to get, um, not react to one or two years of anomaly data, but rather to see what are the problems we're solving for. Um, when you make a policy and you change a policy, you want it to be based on something. We've identified just quickly four areas or bucket areas that have been brought up by constituents, um, certainly by our team in looking at the data. It doesn't mean those are the only ones. 
It doesn't mean that in next year's data we won't see something else. But what we will see is whether these are actually the biggest problems. And if so, then that gives us rationale for coming up with some solutions. That said, I don't think one solution solves all those problems. So to now change one small piece, we now will get another set of data that's now based on admittance of students on something very different. So now we're kind of back to the same thing. Sure, could you imagine, or Superintendent, could you imagine if I told a principal, having been a principal, that data this year, you're seeing these trends, student performances, not where you need with this particular subgroup. And I said, let's wait a few more years to see if this is just like this year or if this is something much bigger. That's literally what we're saying. In a policy that we know rewards wealthy families for going to school with poor kids and further disenfranchises those kids. Because then the 10 points is equal across the board. Everyone got the 10 points. It, right, so and I we're seeing what that meant for tier seven. And you're saying like, and we'll see, we'll make a tweak here and there. We're not proposing any tweak. We're not, we're not right now because we, we only have a single year of the full data set. I think what we're saying is next year at this time, we will have another set of invitations. We will also have another set of MCAS. We'll be able to at least be able to look and see, are we seeing these are the big bucket issues? And if they are, again, this isn't one solution. This is probably a several recommendation solution. But it also feels irresponsible to put something forward that then next year we see something entirely different that maybe the exact thing we put in place this year exacerbated something. It's what we ask school leaders to do all the time. We ask them to look at their data and make decisions based on that trends from a sing from the year. And it is fascinating that like we think this is some sacred cow that like can't have that level of intervention. I I don't I am asking the question, Chair, like, I don't know what to do. I want to stop bringing this up every meeting. I feel for the families who, poor families and families of color who are at school, these seven schools who didn't make the threshold. And I also feel really, for lack of better words, icky about a policy that privileges wealthy families for going to school with poor kids. And so I don't know what to do. I would really like, as I have said, to bring a policy forward for a vote. I don't know how to get that on an agenda. I don't know how to move it forward. But like this doesn't, it, I, it just seems impossible to look away. I mean, I'll reiterate what I talked with you about today. I said that the issue with the points, there are several different perspectives. We've all identified that the points raise some concerns. You're offering or suggesting one particular way of looking at points and creating a solution that way. We have heard from families and others, you know, and even myself have saying, well, you know, you can look at points in a lot of ways. The question is, as soon as we fix it by one perspective, then what about all the other issues that are also being raised? And how do we begin to take a look at the issue of points, period, and looking at all of the perspectives and understanding what points are doing positively or negatively for one group or the other, but just to single out one specific piece of this without looking at the whole thing, I don't feel is any fairer, but I agree that we need to have a clearer discussion overall about the impact of points, but we can't just look at it from any one of our individual perspectives because there are other perspectives as well. So uh, is the question about can we go back and revisit what we know to date about points? You want you want an immediate. Uh, oh, not immediate. I want it. To, I have been talking about this for five months. I hate to say like this is not me being immediate. This is no. me being incredibly patient over the last six months, six months since we looked at that data, asking to have this conversation. So now, as I had said, I think at a meeting, I said, I know we're gonna get to a place where this continues to not get put on the agenda, so that then we say, well now we have enrollment sessions, it's too late to do anything. I literally said that the first time I brought this up. I said, I am scared that we are gonna just continue to kick the can. And that's where now we're at. So I don't want anything immediate. 
but we've, as a committee, have allowed it to get to this place where we're about to roll out next year's policy, and we haven't brought up it up for five months. I, so I, I'm not sure, yes, and I agree with you. One thing will trigger something else. I don't think this policy is biblical. Like, I think it can change. I think it could change all the time until it feels right, until it looks good, until we end a year uh, and we get a year's worth of data that folks are satisfied with. I, it's just not sacred to me. It's not real. We made up the whole system. The whole thing is fake. Like, what are we talking about? The whole thing is, a, it's a big masquerade. And so like, why couldn't we revisit it every year? It's not real. Madam Chair, I believe yes. each, each of us have five minutes, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I was about to yield uh, my, my, as member, I'm sorry, uh, my, my head. Steve, right? time, you yeah. go. Uh, yield to you. I was about to yield my five minutes to you as well, but um, I hear your concern. Uh, I'm one of the uh, members who voted on 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 the policy, and um, at the time that I vote, I voted on it. I did I did review the entire process from the. Uh, from the committee that recommend that um, that policy, and uh, with input from from community, um, and I voted for it. Now one year one year later, I I, I hear you. I understand that uh, the concerns um, regarding the point system. I share that because I I do see that the the point system did not work. To the um, to the point that I would like to see, but at the same time, on the other side, uh, fr from the administration uh, perspective, the one-year data is not really sufficient to measure whether the the program I is successful or not. But at the same time, I do share with you the frustration. Um, that it did not work the way that w that it, it should be, or idealistically it should be, but uh, I, I guess nothing is is you know idealistic and uh, nothing is per perfect in the, in this world. I hear you, but then this is my recommendation. I, I understand that the frustration comes from the data that that we have gathered that shows there's a there's a grave, grave, how would I say it, uh, mis uh, mis uh, application of the point um, system. I would uh, ask you as a member, if you do have, aside from, aside from, from the frustration, given the, the, the limited um, amount of data that we have, is there? Being a, a, um, a policymaker, being a, a, a past um, principal, and involved in, in many school activities, uh, ac uh, school policies before from your past uh, experience, is there any other kind of recommendation, notwithstanding the short amount of time? That you could make to this to this body, that we can that we can really really consider, aside from the limited amount of um, data that we have seen for the for, for one year. So that's my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, without being able to having lost months of building a system to be able to either get the information, a discrete application process, whatever it is, I think you ask people to self-report. You will have people that lie, because people are shitty, but it is much more honest. You will have people who tell the truth, and it is it will still be much more honest than what you have now, which is that you give, we are giving families who are wealthy 10 points and further disadvantaging 
the students who are disadvantaged at that school as a result of that. You've just equalized the fields. The points do nothing in that environment. And, and then I think you figure out a way to, if we believe certain students, which I do, as we do with students in temporary housing, deserve additional points, I do. That is the type of equity work I believe in. Then we can be really smart and sharp and figure out a way to localize it and make sure the kids who need those points, deserve those points, experience the world in a way that we think you bring a different skill and a different talent as a result of those lived experiences. And we reward that here with points. Then great. So. I guess I don't look at the, and, and I completely understand the notion of, oh, which one's mine? All of them. You good, I'm sorry. <laughs> I completely understand the notion of staying on track with data to figure out what a particular trend is. However, there is the concern of if you see something that is such a stark anomaly that it warrants some type of inspection, further in, like inspection of what's going on there. And some of those things you can find very much, uh, you know, you we look at the the comparison, like the tier seven household that could go as, score as low as 68%, right? And still get admitted, um, or invitation, I should say. Um, and that doesn't feel as much of a correction that disrupts the stability of your data as much as it is gathering more data. <laughs> You're gathering more data by being able to, to allow people to self-report or to offer more information that then you can take into account there. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I, I mean, I see the, the and I mean, I, I would love to hear more about, um, and I think all of us, I mean, especially all of us who are new, because I wasn't on the committee when this decision was made either, and I think all of us would do well to go back and revisit, like, just the the exam school admissions policy presentations, all of the notes from there, so that we understand, like, how it came, because, you know, I'm not sure how, I, I understand sort of the discrepancy of the 50% versus 40%. On some level, it can seem arbitrary, uh, and I don't know necessarily where that comes from. Um, so I'd love to understand more about that. Um, but, you know, I think back to my original point, which is, is that if you see something that is such an anomaly like I think we're seeing in particular, like tier seven, we're obligated to do something about it to 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 investigate more <laughs> at the very at the very least, um, and so yeah, I I mean I I agree with like you, Mr. Tron, that like I don't know what a course correction would look like or a policy that we could suggest in a timely fashion that would that would do something, but it could be. Um, as simple as um, giving families the option to provide more data, like with that, um, you know. But I'd love to hear from you know, like um, Ms. Hogan, uh, about like how that potentially could be integrated, and I'm, that's could be for a later conversation. But um, that would be one of my curiosities of how that could be integrated moving forward. Um, one of the Part of the process that the task force went through um, was actually looking at what other districts do in various um, in various different admission cycles. So the the tier modeling is actually um, modeled after what Chicago does. Um, the additional points are modeled after something Detroit does. Um, I believe it was Charlotte Mecklenburg, and I can double check if that is the right district or not. Um, but there is a district that actually does. Um, for socioeconomic reporting, does ask individuals to both self-report and look at um, data that they have available. Um, so that's something that the task force considered. Um, they ultimately did not bring that forward to the superintendent as a policy recommendation, um, but it, it is certainly something that they discussed. And No, 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 thank you for that. So something that would be very helpful for, for us is looking at what were, what were perhaps some of the unintended consequences of these other districts, and maybe they saw something similar that happened within their <coughs> districts that we could look to, and then further, I think, to 
Member Cardet Hernandez's point, if they noticed any of these inequities that were particularly glaring, what did they do about it? And did they do something about it immediately? Or did they sort of wait and say, hey, in about five years, we want to see if this shakes out? Because I think that would provide some guidance for this body as to what we can do, what either should be done, and if other districts have seen similar uh, unintended consequences of it. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for yeah. that. Monica, do you remember, um, or April, uh, what the discussion around the five years was? Did that come from one of the other district's plans? What was the cadence for which they were doing review? I don't remember the specifics, but we can go back okay. to the notes and, and okay. see where that came from. Great. Okay, did you want to say, I wasn't sure if April wanted to say something before April? we moved. Um, I just want to talk from the perspective of like being a district administrator and like administrating these sorts of programs. And so the idea of going to like the localized stud uh, student or family income is kind of contrary to what we're seeing in many um, education based programs. And I talked a little bit about this in the spring. And so I would point to the reason why we've moved away from free and, re and reduced price lunch, which is a barrier for students and families to get access to breakfast, lunch, and a snack throughout the school day. Similarly, at the higher education level, the federal government has made a move to pair collecting financial information with IRS tax forms because it was hard to get the families that we need, those who are experiencing economic discomfort and disadvantage, to actually get the federal funds that they could get so they could attend higher education. And so if the purpose of a policy is to open up access and equity for a broad range of families, I think that we have a lot of experience and knowledge of large programs that show that creating more barriers at application works against those aims. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. This has uh, been a very thoughtful conversation and an important one. Um, it's interesting, Mr. Tran and Chair Robinson and myself were part of that <laughs> committee and the memories that are, are flooding back about that process as well as many of uh, the administrators in the room who worked on it as well is pretty incredible and a number of members of the public. It was an extraordinarily um, involved, thoughtful process, particularly the last task force that brought us the policy that we have now. So just for a little bit of history, the first change was because the pandemic happened, we could not do testing. And so, and it was superintendent at the time, Superintendent Casilius, um, recommended a policy of no exam and that we just did it with, um, by zip code was the first year. And I remind members mm -hmm. that there is still a lawsuit pending from that first policy that is working its way through the appeals process. So we just have to be mindful of that as well. Um, then there was a very public process of a task force that had two chairs and a number of members that had a variety of viewpoints. And I by no means want to oversimplify it, but you could kind of say um, one group of interested parties in the city felt, quite frankly, that these should be lottery schools and that there should be no exam, no testing, it should be 100% lottery. Mm -hmm. And another group felt very strongly that these were merit-based schools and that there should be merit. And how do we determine merit? The committee in its marching orders to the task force had said, we are interested in having the exam schools more reflect the population of the city and have socioeconomic diversity. That was a key focus of ours. And so, we asked the task force to come back to us, and after a tremendous amount of work, I, I give great credit to the members of the task force who, quite frankly, came from very, very different viewpoints. They reached a compromise position, and they recommended to us what they viewed as a compromise position. Um, folks who follow the classes process closely know at the very end it became a little bit messy because some outside forces try to get the task force to change their recommendation about one piece of it. They were going to recommend, I believe, that 20 percent be by merit citywide and that 80 percent be through the tiers. Mm -hmm. 
There were some other folks that had opinions that tried to assert themselves into the task force process, and the task force did not appreciate it. By the way, not committee involved at all. Task force did not appreciate it. Um, they came forward with their recommendation that basically took away that 80-20 split and did an equal thing by tiers and added the points. As uh, Ms. Hogan, uh, Dr. Hogan or Ms. Hogan, I'm sorry? Ms. Hogan. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, as Ms. Hogan said, the, the task force had recommended 50%. Our superintendent at the time, Dr. Casilius, changed the recommendation, that was the only thing I believe she changed, to 40% because she wanted to line it to the federal Title I, as Ms. Hogan said, the federal Title I funding. Under the theory was, as you brought up, Mr. Cardet Hernandez, how hard it is to be able to actually track. So she felt tie it to, basically, if it was good enough for federal funding, it was, it was a better standard than to do. Ironically, by doing that, it actually narrowed the number of schools that are at 40 versus 50. So it had cut it down to a couple. This committee, I for one, have spoken extensively, I think the chair did as well, um, that we were concerned about unintended consequences of that, about yeah. what it was going to do to those schools. Would it cause children to not enroll, parents not to enroll at those schools? Um, so we wanted to see the data and make sure that children from those schools were getting in. Are they getting in at the same level that they were before? No. Are they getting in at the same level as some other schools? No. And are we seeing it particularly in tiers seven and eight? Yes. Does that concern me? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I also, you know, look at s the superintendent went through a few things. You know, the ten points. Um, what are the consequences to parents of choosing schools or starting to move out? What about the students who are getting perfect composite scores, particularly in seven and eight, and not able to get in? Um, equal distribution of seats versus percent of seats. The superintendent, I, I took notes when you write down, you kind of grouped it into five. There are a bunch of concerns that have come to us in the past year, year and a half since we voted that policy, and the, and the most concern has been around the points. People don't understand it. They struggle with it. Mm -hmm. I struggle with it. I also say I voted for it because it was part of a compromise and it allowed two very different groups with very different opinions and vested interest and um, desires for this group of schools to find a compromise in the middle. And the problem with compromise, as we learned from Washington, D.C. in the past couple of days, is no one's ever happy with a compromise, right? And um, I continue to struggle with the points and the impacts. I'm also very mindful that there is a lawsuit winding its way through the court system and I get nervous about tinkering on the edges and the committee at the time, and we are a different committee, right? It is not the seven who voted before, though I know we don't have two members here tonight. Um, they wanted to put this to bed and to stop future for committees from tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. Though, Mr. Carrera Hernandez, you raise an excellent point. Like, this is not written in stone, right? It, mm -hmm. The admissions policy to our exam schools has changed over the years. Um, I am personally am quite swayed by the superintendent's desire to get more data and see if it's anomaly or not. And yet I also hear the point that you're raising, Ms. Carrera Hernandez, about are we doing injustice to certain students? Is that same thing going to happen this year or not? Um, I also remain keenly interested in how the students who are there are mm -hmm. doing. And what is the right solution if we were to make a change? You know, we got five potential issues on the table. Mm -hmm. One thing I do struggle with, and I'm being very honest, is asking for self-selection, self-reporting. Um, I, 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 I do struggle with that, particularly with the issues that you just raised. And as we've been moving away from that, that as a solution, that challenges is me. It doesn't mean that we can't find another solution. Um, so I think we continue looking at this. But I'm just saying from someone who has been it through before, and I'm saying this to the newer members who are rightfully asking really thoughtful, good questions, and I'm loving that we're having this conversation. Touching a piece of it, it, it it's almost like the, the Jenga, <coughs> you know, that we all played as a mm -hmm. child and our children play now. Like, if we, if we touch one piece, what's going to happen to what had become a carefully crafted solution. 
And this is the person who, the day he voted, said, I'm very concerned about unintended consequences. And I've asked, Ms. Hogan can relate how many times I've asked over the years for data about the 10 point schools or the schools that don't have the 10 points and what are the results. So I'm open to, I personally, just speaking for myself, I'm open to a continual conversation. I just want to put some concerns out there on mm -hmm. the table as well. And I think, quite frankly, to me, this is the type of thing that I turn to the superintendent and say, you need a team looking at this deeply, thinking about these and coming back to us with is there a recommendation here? And whether it involves some outside folks, you know, maybe the two co-chairs of the previous task force coming back and thinking because there was history in how this was put together. I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'm just nervous about us trying to, you know, tinker with one piece and finding one solution. But this is an important issue, obviously. Yes. So I think I didn't even ask a question. I just spoke for it in five minutes. I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, just a very quick comment. Whatever it is going to happen, whether we are revisiting the issue, whether we are going to look at the entire policy again, I want to be on the record. If there is a recommendation for self-reporting require, requirement for self-reporting, I will strongly oppose. I just want to make sure that it is on the record. I will strongly oppose that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, my only statement, I mean, I don't want to get caught down one particular solution. Mm -hmm. I, like, I will say with regard to the self-reporting, I hear the concerns also about the barriers of data. I can also say that I know private schools that do this. They ask for self-reporting. They don't factor it into it. They say it gives us more information about the need that you might have once you get here. And so in that sense, it's been proven and shown that you can use it just as data and not as a penalty against those students. And families are more inclined to, if you'd give them the opportunity to do so. And it's not saying that it's gonna factor, like it's gonna say, no, you're not gonna get in because of this, or you, but it gives us more information to sort of figure out the, like where those inequities lie. So, I mean, I hear it. I also know that it, I've also like looked this year, <coughs> my, own, my own child, this year, where they said, hey, here's, a, here's an application. You can self-report your, you know, your income. And that's just to see if you, rec if you get assistance or not, right? So I know that it happens. And I think sometimes we pretend like these things don't exist and they do. And I think, you know, it's like we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. We can use data in a way that's not necessarily, I mean, data can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Uh, like, but I do believe that, you know, if you give people the opportunity, they can choose for themselves as to like what data is relevant for, for us to make a more informed decision. That's all. Sure. Um, I appreciate the conversation that we're having, particularly around the unintended consequences of the things that couldn't be known or seen. But going back to the kind of original um, objective of the policy, we, you know, while we are definitely seeing it work in the sense of diversity of geographic diversity, racial, socioeconomic, um, there are some areas that we are not seeing an impact. And I think we have to consider that as we think about any changes going forward. So for instance, we have seen in special education, the percent go from three to 6%. That is really far, far below the district average at the high school and the seventh and eighth grade levels. For our multilingual learners, there's virtually no access. So while it is true that the intent of the policy, it is making strides in certain areas, there are still some areas for which it is not, and we need to think about what other changes could potentially need to be made so that when we say access, we mean access. Thank you. I don't know, I, I don't know, it feels like we are just doing the thing that we do, which is like, we'll talk about it later. 
Like, I feel like that could be like the headline for our meetings. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Like, I, I think, yeah, I think there's like something we can do now. And I, maybe we have an offline conversation about what, how we move that forward as a mm -hmm. body. And that can be a policy change or whatever the conversations are happening in this building around considerations we're gonna have. It, it could be everything from keeping the policy as is and starting to collect additional data t around self-reporting. We Next cannot steps. sit here mm -hmm. and just say that what this current data shows us is acceptable and we, are d we wanna do nothing about, we mm -hmm. just wanna wait a little longer to see if it was one bad year or two bad years or three bad years or four or five. Like, what is wrong with us? <laughs> like, we have enough data to be like, oh, we should do something now. Or we should get, we should have more data for next year's decision. I don't know, this just feels okay, like two we, should, can, we should, yeah. Okay. So we have a recommendation right now from the superintendent of what she'd like to do in this next year. One of the things we have already talked about is that having some clarity about what these updates are going to mean so that it's just not an update without clear next steps of, so this update we are going to look at X, which is going to give us information so that my issue is for next school year, we're not sitting here having the same conversation, but they ha we have clarity about what it is that we are seeing in the data and what potentially that means that we can do. My, my big concern, as I've said to you earlier about the points, is there are, there's more than one concern about the points. And my issue is that they all need to be fully vetted. We can't just decide we like this issue versus another issue. So one of the first things is we need to convene a full conversation with all of the various iterations that many different people, including ourselves, have raised so that we can equitably look at those and then apply those to looking at the current data we do have to understand what is happening, um, unintended or whatever. Um, we need to really do some mining of our current data to understand what is the impact right now in those schools in terms of kids who are, you know, qualified but get in or don't get in, et cetera. But that's happening for a number of groups of students. I mean, I, I feel the pain for, for young people who have never had an opportunity. I also feel pain for some of our children who have traditionally gotten in and cannot get in because of changes in the policy. So equitably, I wanna understand the good and the bad of the points and not just steer it in one direction. So I really feel we need to have that very serious and open conversation and then go from there to what is the recommendation? Because you're right, we can be here forever because it's not clear what, what do we want the data to say. And, and, and I would, even in this room, I'm sure everybody has a different opinion of how they would wanna see this data looked at. But I think the one thing we all agree is the points are causing us some concerns of things that we need to look at and look at now so it can help us make a better decision sooner and not to keep having this go on and on and on. You know, my assumption clearly is we can't make a change for this school year, but we can certainly do the work mm -hmm. that informs us early on so that we have that decision for, for next year. Right, that, that's exactly right. Um, I, I think what we're talking about is in having the year to year data, um, year over year, we would um, have the invitation data that would happen in the spring and then there's a comparison that would happen there and we can come back and report on that. And if there's something with recommendation around that particular piece, we, we can make that recommendation. Then there's um, the actual MCAS and, and other kinds of um, end of year data that we collect that is available early fall and so we can look at that. <clears throat> I think there's also you know, this question of how are students doing um, who have gotten in since the various changes in the policy and what are the different supports that are being offered in each of the schools, because they're all really different. Um, so <clears throat> I think those are all pieces that we, we're all, we are like in a, 
in a unified way committed to looking at. Um, and so we will, um, you know, we will update committee regularly as each of those pieces of data becomes available uh, along with what any recommendation would be. I'm, I'm gonna end after this because there was, I, I, we've spent enough time, but there, I think it's not just like, let's come here and look at the data. Like if we know that there are concerns in the data, then we should be talking about policy recommendations mm -hmm. here. And I, my fear, my suspicion is that will not happen. <laughs> that we will not be having policy conversations here. We'll just wait for a recommendation from someone to tell us what to do, we'll vote yes, and we'll wait another year, mm -hmm. or we'll wait five. And so I'll do my part to keep raising it, to try to see something change here. Um, yeah, but we're not having policy conversations here, we're just looking at, because if we were, we would, all of us would be pulling the fire alarm when you see that the what you see happened to tier seven. Like <coughs> recognize it didn't work. Um, so I'll I'll keep calling you to sort of figure out what we can do. Um, it's clear that we're not going to vote on any recommendation, and that, as I suspected, if you wait six months to have this conversation, it will be too late. Um, and member Kudenin, I just I just want to clarify your. The, when you say the fire alarm in tier seven, the particular issue you're talking about in tier seven is the group of students who individually would um, qualify for socioeconomic uh, above below the forty uh, above the forty percent, but for whom they did not get a, uh, an offer of a seat. That is your particular issue with tier seven. Yeah, my issue is any young person who's economically disadvantaged who doesn't get points. I don't care what school they go to. My issue is also any person who is not economically disadvantaged who gets points for going to school with economically disadvantaged kids. I think, yeah, okay. because we're not talking about school quality. I mean, if we were really gonna do it, it's like yeah. I would have a conversation which is you get 10 points if we're willing to stand up here and say, that's not a great school. And so like we think you get 10 extra points because we're sending you to a school that's of low quality. But the only thing we're saying is you get extra points for being around poor folks, that is bonkers. That is bonkers. And like I, I for me, it, it just, it's not my values. Like from my, the deepest place of my heart, like that is just not my values. And that you then have poor kids who go to the Elliott or wherever one of those six schools are who don't get points because they go to school with affluent kids, but the, the affluent kid who goes to school with poor kids gets points? What, you like think about it, it's wild. So that is my issue. I think you saw data points in tier seven and, and all the other stuff, I get that those are other folks' issues. That can be everyone's issues. I'm the member who's saying, this is the thing <laughs> I wanna talk about. Okay. And this is the it's thing fair, I want to vote on changing. Enough. And I get that there's six other things. I don't care about those six things right now. I care about this because it feels like such a real area of inequity. Mm -hmm. And like everyone can do all the hard work of all the meetings and all the task force. And I respect them for that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we then look back and we're like, that wasn't great. I had that millions of times as a principal. I had that working in city government where I thought this was a good idea. Right. It wasn't. And then you have to mission abort. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of those moments mm -hmm. where we should be really sober about mission abort. Mm -hmm. Is there a way of getting that direct data that we're talking about here? Around can you mine the data differently in tier seven to look at the, the issues of are there children who are not getting in because of the issue of points in either of these circumstances? They're either going to a school that does not get points, and therefore there are kids who would qualify who are not getting invitations because they fall too far below. Um, I'm just trying to understand what we're gonna be looking for to understand the current impact of that, as well as looking at the other concerns around tiers that have been brought up. Yeah, so this would be the percent of students in tier seven and eight, in particularly in those schools that were disqualified for the points, who, uh, according to 
um, Title Title One uh, are considered a, not a Title One student, and so what percent of those students did not ultimately get a seat? And based on their own individual economic yeah. status, yes, yeah. and conversely, um, the other. Yeah, so which I, I think the we're getting. Um, the economic status data will continue to be flawed in the ways that we've already talked about tonight. Um, I think we can we can certainly compile the data in that way that's been requested, but I think there's we still don't have a full picture of economic status for any students who do not attend BPS, um, and we still only have a limited look at economic status for students who do attend BPS, right? So it's always going to be a, a flawed data point in that sense. Right. And I think that um, for the students that don't attend BPS who are applying, um, you know, even in things like collection of grades and things like that, it is really dealing individually with every single one of those schools. Um, and so now you go one more level down to each of those individual parents. And that's, <coughs> yeah, it seems like the data could be wrong on a lot of accounts or that families would not com may not come forward with the data. Um, I think you see this at the high school level with FAFSA a lot. That's been my experience is that when it comes to FAFSA, when you ask for documentation, that means something different to a lot of different families. And we certainly wouldn't want to open up a situation that by that mere suggestion would cause a family to not have their students sit for the test. Yeah. There is always the way to self-report without asking for any information, just asking folks to be honest. The recognition, not everyone will do it, but a lot of, but a lot of folks will. Mm. And so I, I'm with you. I, I remember my own FAFSA experience. Uh, I, I didn't have the paperwork. It wasn't even a, a, a desire not to. It's like, no one was keeping tax papers in my, why would you? That wasn't, it just wasn't part of our, the DNA. But you could ask folks to self-report and just be honest. And we have enough data that we would for sure know certain kids who definitely get those mm -hmm. 10 points. Okay. okay. And I, I will that, yield my know, time. Again, I think it's one of the ways that we need to look at the impact of the points. But again, we'd like to look at yeah. all of the different oh, yeah. ways that people have identified points. So my question, Superintendent, is I know we are doing um, data, I mean, um, agenda planning. Um, if we could have from you in writing sort of a process yes. that would allow us to get to have this conversation in its entirety and the implications of recommendations that could look at changes going forward. 3 h yes. So the, the we'll, we'll group, regroup as a team and g provide a memo that will list out um, the times at which we can report back and then have schedule conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Um, yeah, it, it appears we're moving on. I will say in, in to the issue that uh, you raised, uh, Dr. Alkins, and that Ms. Hogan said, I'm actually going to be talking with the folks from Charlotte Mecklenburg on a different matter shortly, so I'm going to ask them the questions yeah. that you raised mm -hmm. um, about what the out outcome was, unintended mm -hmm. consequences, how they track that type of thing. So it's a beauty of being able to check with other cities, right, to see yeah. that other cities have struggled with these issues as well. So let's. Sure. Let's find out about that. Mm -hmm. um, Chair, may I ask a question about another Certainly. part of the superintendent's mm -hmm. report? I think, I think yeah. we wrapped up on yeah. this topic, right? Mm -hmm. Superintendent, thank you for the update about uh, the West Roxbury Education Complex, and I'm glad those community <coughs> meetings are being held and that you're listening to the input that is coming in from a, a variety of mm -hmm. folks. Um, I, I do want to ask you, we're talking about a, a potential transportation and, and the chances to run buses out there. Um, could you update me, please, on, and I know we've talked about this in the past, the possibility of actually having a commuter rail stop right there, mm -hmm. which I think would potentially, no matter what school is there, could be a game changer because then students can, can ride a commuter rail either from South Station or Back Bay or Ruggles. It's direct to, the, you know, there's a park right next to it, so clearly a stop could be built. Now the students get off. You're not relying on buses. You're not relying on city streets. You know, those commuter rails go back and forth all the time. So, but that's a conversation with the state and with the MBTA. Are those ongoing? What are the likelihood of success? What could we do to make that So they that are happen? ongoing. I know I see Chief Stanislaus rising. 
Um, but it, this is an active conversation. I think um, you know the city and we would really like to see this stop put in because we, to your point, it would be so beneficial from particular pinpoints around the city for our kids. Um, I think that in our slide deck uh, that I, I quoted earlier, you will see uh, where the proposed stop would be and then there's some additional information. Chief, do you wanna add? Good night, everyone. Um, the mayor um, has started conversations with the state, state about the proposed like commuter rail stop for that uh, West Roxbury area um, behind the school. So conversations have started. Um, Dan Rosengard, who is the executive director of transportation, met with um, Tiffany, the mayor's chief of staff, and the MBTA. And I know that the mayor also has follow-up conversations. So those conversations are ongoing. Okay, I, I personally think that would be a game changer for any proposal for that school. I, I think that changes the transportation conversation 100% as someone who's ridden commuter rail <laughs> a lot as well as Orange Line a lot. I'd rather be on the commuter rail than Orange Line even though I ride the Orange Line more today. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. If there's any of the questions that involve the transportation piece, I'm just going to ask Chief to stay for a minute so you don't have to keep going back and forth. Do you have any questions? No. no. Just one question about the FCA. Um, it's actually Teresa. <laughs> dun, 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 come on down. Um, is there a plan to publish building utilization data in the FCA, and if not now, then when? Sorry, is there a plan to publish? Building utilization data. In terms of the number of students who are both capacity mm -hmm. and current and uh, current usage yes, percent it's use. Yes, it's a part of the SCA. Because, well, but it doesn't have the sum total. The sum total of you of usage per square footage. Yeah, that is something that we're going to be in analyzing over the next few months. That we will put on the dashboard as well. Because in it, it will say like I don't know, sixty percent. There's like a like this is don't quote me, sixty percent or eighty percent used. Correct. What's the word? What does it actually say? So it's the amount of um, students per square footage based on the program programmatic use of the building. building. And that's being analyzed by both our, um, <coughs> internally the operations team and our PANDA, the planning and analysis team Got it. for the enrollment use. Because then it would be interesting to know, you know, like moving walls around, doing whatever you do, like how much, how many young people does this building have the capacity to hold? Yeah, yeah that's the work that PANDA is doing with it. Yeah. It's, it's also difficult to the point of the programming, right? right? Because each programming, and now with inclusion, different class sizes. So from that perspective, yep. when we used to think of utilization of a building, it was on the gen max class size for the union contract. But now with all the different programs, it's different. But it's a, you know, it is, this is a good point to say, um, you know, we will probably base it more on thinking of inclusion as given that that is our, gonna be our learning plan going forward. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anything else before we? Nothing else? All right. No. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'll now entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Is there any objection to approving the motion by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the superintendent's report is approved. We'll now move on to general public comment. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, caregivers, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. This meeting will feature two public comment periods with the first comment period limited to one hour. Priority will be given to those testifying in person. Time permitting, the committee will then open it up to virtual testimony. After one hour, anyone who is not testified will have the opportunity to do so at the end of the meeting. We have 23 speakers this evening each person will have two minutes to speak, and I'll remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. 
If your remarks are longer than two minutes, please email your comments for distribution to the committee. The time that an interpreter uses for English interpretation will not be deducted from a speaker's allotted time. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual school committee members or district staff. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you're from before you begin. We'll begin with our students, Johan Pineda, He'll be followed by Amina Pena and Maritza Montero. Uh, hello. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Johan Pineda. I'm in 11th grade. At 16 years old, I attend Boston Latin School and I work with the T-Law Division of MassCosh. TLA stands for Teens Lead at Work. Teens Lead at Work collaborates with other youth programs like SSYP, St. Stephen's Youth Programs, in order to create surveys and gather data on the VPS student body experience. Some questions we consider are what can be changed, what are some flaws, and how do students feel about attending their VPS schools? MassCost worked together with SSYP over the summer of 2023 in order to gather data and advocate for VPS students regarding the education system and their curriculums. We brainstormed possible roots of the problem and hypothesized possible outcomes the problems at the root of VPS lead to and solutions for them in student-led discussions. Additionally, MassCosh and SSYP jointly created a student survey which asked the students of VPS how they feel attending their schools, what issues commonly arise within them, and what they would like to be changed or improved. Over the course of the summer, we at the TLA division of MassCosh learned some of the main priorities of the VPS student body. Hygienic, updated, and sturdy architectural re reform within BPS schools is one major issue. Additionally, the majority of students attending Boston Public Schools demand a much more open curriculum. BPS students find that course options at BPS are sometimes limited, therefore limiting student development and success overall. And many students express a desire to have more options and a bigger say in their class curriculums. On top of that, students at Boston Public Schools want more priority on career counseling and career-based opportunities in their schools. A majority seconds. of students feel as though their schools don't provide enough of these opportunities and, and don't help enough for students to follow and develop their future career paths. What we are here to ask today is we would like to request the opportunity to present our work, which consists of, but isn't limited to, our slide decks, our student survey, and this one pager at the school committee meeting on November 15th in order to give the committee insight into what BPS students need while so many changes are being made to the district now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amina Pena. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maritza Montero. Montero. Okay. Thank you. Next we'll hear from John Mudd followed by Matt Sly and Kathleen Shardow. Can we just give applause yeah. to the yes, student? Thank you. <laughs> nice job. Can we put this on the agenda? We'll put this on the agenda. That was <clears throat> Good evening. My name is John Mudd. I'm a longtime education advocate in Boston. Is it working? Or is there long time uh, resident of Cambridge, long time education advocate in Boston. Um, I must say I was looking forward to seeing an analysis of opportunity and achievement gaps in the MCAS 2023 report to be presented tonight. Uh, aside from an obligatory kind of comment and reference in the equity statement, I may have missed something, but I didn't see any analysis of the achievement gap or even mention of opportunity and achievement gaps in the report that I saw, the presentation. Uh, I think that's unfortunate. I think that as a priority uh, for the school system and the school committee, that it should receive priority attention. Uh, I did make a presentation last week on and, and distributed testimony last week, and hopefully you got it again tonight, in which it showed a huge opportunity gaps for English learners. Uh, this, uh, there's disappointing, I think, results on the access tests uh, showing uh, unfortunately low uh, learning of English in the system. The 
ELL Task Force has repeatedly said we are on a wrong course of English immersion in our strategies for English learners, and we need to give attention and priority to access to native language in the development of programs for English learners. For blacks, I have, uh, there was a whole section I did not uh, get a chance to review with the committee last week. Uh, it, I don't need to go through the details. I hope you can look at them. The, uh, the uh, data on achievement levels is unacceptably low. The data on uh, achievement gaps is still unacceptably high. And it's not just a matter of looking at the data. The Mr. key issue, issue is what are we doing Mr. about Mark, it? Mr. Mark. Your time. Your That's time. It. Thank so you. So what are we doing about it and how are we addressing it? That, I think, warrants a full discussion by the committee uh, at some future date. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Sly. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Sly. I'm a BPS parent from Jamaica Plain, and I'm here to talk about 10 points, I'm sorry to say. Um, I, I, the, 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 the discussion is very spirited, and I do believe that the intention behind the 10 points is quite noble, but the implementation is incredibly flawed. Um, I've submitted a PDF, and I hope you guys have had a chance to see it, and it's got a lot of data that April has been extremely helpful to me at gathering, and particularly <clears throat> looking at the percentages of students in the various tiers who got their first choice school, and also pointing out the cutoff scores at each school. As we've mentioned, it was 100.2 in Tier 7 for Boston Latin, meaning that all 86 non-point students in Tier 7 were excluded from Boston Latin. 54% of the 10 points applicants in Tier 7 got their first choice, compared to 6% of the non-points. So I think we should pause and just say, where did the 10 points come from? Why is it not 7 or 13? I, my guess is it's arbitrary. I've heard no justification for it. Now, if a student ignored data that was available and turned it in unsubstantiated guess, they'd get a poor grade. And I think we should, ex we, the school district should do the same thing. Why would we continue to use an arbitrary value rather than use data that's there and iterate on it? We could very simply look at the distribution and the difference between the median scores of point students and non-point students and <coughs> use that value as the adjustment. It's probably more than zero because schools matter, but it's clearly less than 10. It's probably closer to one or two. And the data is there. So why are we anchored on an arbitrary value? It sounds like the only argument is bureaucratic inertia. And I'm sorry, I'm just not willing to accept that. I work in an industry where we make changes every week based on data. And if the only reason not to do it is simply because we don't have the, the willpower, that's incredibly disappointing to me. I have become somewhat of an expert <laughs> in this area, and I'd be very willing to like, work with anybody here, dig into the data deeply, and explain some ideas for how to improve it without many, with very simple changes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Chardavoy. She'll be followed by Venkat Chasel, excuse me, Chastelani. Um, good evening, I'm Kathleen Chardavoy, and I'm a BPS parent from Charlestown. Um, I brought uh, some data, a poster, it's not nearly as cheerful as the, the first speakers, but I did want to speak about my concerns about the exam school policy, and specifically the equal allocation of seats to tiers. Regardless of what happens with bonus points, these admission rates will remain consistent if we do not change how, uh, how seats are allocated to tiers. Let's look at what happened in seventh grade last year and this year. We now have two years of data based on the, the equal assignment of seats to tiers. In tier seven last year, you can see that it, the admission rates in tiers one two, through five approached 100% in tiers seven and eight, 61 and 45%. The same thing repeated this year, a little worse for tier seven at 48%. You look at the number of rejected applicants in tier seven and eight, it's 278 last year, 280 this year. That is not an anomaly. That is a real data point. It, it was simulated by the task force. It happened last year. It happened this year. It will happen next year. Um, 
Now, I, this is why families in tier seven and eight say this policy is unfair. This policy targets us for exclusion. And I recognize that the policy was never intended to be fair. The policy was intended to be equitable. But when one looks at the ninth grade admission rates, the most disadvantaged tier last year was tier two. The most disadvantaged tier this year was tier four. How is that equitable? I'm just, I know I don't have much time, but I'm just gonna switch to the tier map, which I know you've all seen. And I just wanna point out that this city is a mosaic. Ms. Every Shardaway. neighborhood is a mosaic. If you are on one side of this line, Ms. your Shardaway. admission rates vary greatly it, than if you're on the other. So something needs to be done about the seat allocation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Venkat. I'm, I'm also a BPS uh, parent. I'm from Charlestown, and it's a tough act to follow after Kathleen. And, uh, but here's what I would say. I would say one word, Ford Pinto. That's what, I, I had prepared remarks, but I got so mad, that's what I'm going to say. Ford, if, for all, if you have some level of vintage, you'll remember that. They released a car that was fully flawed because they said, the numbers work out. Let's work the numbers. My kids are not a statistic. I mean, we are an educational system. You are not in private equity. This is unbelievable that you sit here and talk about statistics as if there is no human involved in that. You say, oh, that is 10%. It's OK. This number is that much. That number is that much. How does that work? My kid came home crying because he has a really high score, and he had zero points, and he couldn't get in, and his friends got in because they're in a different zone. How is that equitable? How is that, that not unjust? So you know, think about it. I mean, I agree with everything that Kathleen and everybody else is saying. Look at the policy. Make a decision. And then, at the minimum, make sure that the kids who lost out in the last three years figure out if they can get into ninth grade. Change the policy. Increase the number of seats. It's easy. Increase the number of seats at BLS, and then make sure that these kids get in. Um, I don't understand. I mean, why is we are all sitting here and talking about these things like statistics as if there are no real people involved? There needs to be some level of equity of people. I'm sorry, but I'm losing my cool because One I listened second. to this conversation. There's no movement. It's exactly the same conversation I heard six months ago when this policy was designed. I, I, I agree with, the, with Mr. Hernandez here. It's, nothing changed. You talk and talk and talk, and I know nothing is going to change. The only choice we have is people like me to leave the city. I'm an immigrant. I'm, I'm not white. I'm a colored person. I mean, you, you, take, you take all the boxes. I'm, I belong to a lot of those boxes. Excuse me, Mr. I mean, Johnson. this is, I, I'm sorry, but this is unbelievable. Our next speaker is Alicia Bascom, followed by David Barstow and Kerry Akashian. Okay, um, good night, my name is Alicia, and I have been employed with BPS over 50 years as a monitor. My problem is the payroll system and the way monitors are being treated. We leave our house at 4.30 every day to get to work. Students are beating up on us, spitting on us. Parents are beating us and swearing at us. And we work, and for me, I'm a faithful worker. I've been to work every single day. And yet, at the end of the payroll, payroll messed up. We gotta wait two weeks for it to be fixed. And yet, when the two weeks come, it still isn't fixed. It's our next problem added to that. And then the nineteen dollars an hour can't pay a eighteen hundred or two thousand dollars month rent in the city of Boston, which we are required to live in. Now you all waive that. So if we still move out now, we still have to come with first and last rent, which is two and four thousand dollars. Nineteen dollars isn't cutting it. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next speaker is David Barstow. Thanks, good evening. Um, I think the data speaks it for itself as uh, Matt and others have walked through. I'm just trying to, um, again, personalize this a little bit. Uh, my name's David Barstow. I'm the uh, parent of two BPS students. Um, last spring, my wife testified about the exam school's policies effect on our family. Our older daughter, Eliza, is a sophomore at Boston Latin. Our 12-year-old, Emmeline, who had a composite score of 95.45, was denied a seat at all the exam schools. We live in Tier 7, um, which has been discussed a lot tonight. She attends the Elliott School, which is ineligible for bonus points. Now that BPS has shared the data around minimum composite scores, it's clear that she and lots of other high-achieving kids like her in Tier 7 and 8 never had a shot. Um, that's an unintended consequence, right? Um, no child from Tier 7 without bonus points was admitted. Um, kid, uh, admitted to BLS. Kids in those tiers needed a 97 to get into any exam school. Uh, I'm really grateful for member Cardite Hernandez's commitment to localize the bonus points so they only go to students whose individual circumstances warrant them. This would allow applicants in tier seven and eight to compete for exam school seats on a more level playing field. However, this change will not affect the overall admissions rates for the different tiers. Admissions rates would still be close to 100% in tiers one through five and less than 50% in tiers seven through eight. Um, applications, applicants in seven and eight would still need that near perfect score to gain admission. That the tiers, and this goes to the, the comment about the city is a mosaic, right? The, that the tiers themselves are so crudely drawn is another issue. We live in tier seven, but literally across the street from us is tier four. So if we lived at 246 instead of 245, my, my daughter would have sailed into BLS, no problem, right? That doesn't, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's why, in addition to fixing the points, I asked the committee to allocate seats to tiers based on the number of applicants, as, as it was talked about earlier. Um, this would ensure seats are allocated proportionally and fairly. Um, all right, uh, that is my time. I guess the one last point I'd like to say is, you know, where do the kids that are missing out on these opportunities uh, to enter in seventh and ninth, where are they gonna go? Um, and would you send your kids to some of these other, other schools in the uh, program right now? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Akashian, followed by Liam Quinn. I'm just gonna read from this. Hi, my name is Carrie Akashian, and I live in Tier 7 with my daughter, Fallon Perez, who's in seventh grade. I have fought for educational equity my entire adult life, but today I'm here to advocate for my daughter. I have three points and two requests. When I saw the chart that was released by BPS last week, I felt like I was punched in the gut. I saw that in tier seven, the composite scores to get in were extremely high. It is an impossibility to attend at least Boston Latin as the score is 100.2. When I see the scores, this is the second point, it shows that BPS expects parents in, peers in tier seven to pay for private schools for their children as the non-exam schools for the most part are woefully inadequate for high achieving students. BPS assumes everyone in tier seven can do this. I cannot as a single parent. The per Three, the purpose of the exam school changes were to work towards educational equity for black and brown students. Well, it is failing some. My daughter is a Latina with a composite score of 93. Any black or brown student in tier seven or any part of the city who receives in the 90s should be attending exam schools and should not be held back. The Office of Women's Advancement for the city of Boston claims that Latinas are the least paid demographic in Boston and nationally. Black and brown students with composite scores in the 90s need to attend exam schools, as everyone knows here, to help them to succeed and they should not be held back. Um, so I have two points, and basically it's to revisit the, um, the point system, especially for tier seven, and also, and I was much more um, ambitious, I guess, than my peers. I, I taught at Lowell High School for 12 years and we had to make room for students in up till November from vocational schools and they, we needed to adapt and I had to adapt around them. I was saying these students that are getting in the 90s, black and brown students who were not admitted should be, it's the first week of October, they should be admitted now because they shouldn't have to wait. Why are we playing this with our students, with our children? It's not okay, it's just not okay. So maybe for their eighth grade so they won't have to wait, that would be wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liam Quinn. <coughs> Uh, 
Um, all right, how's it going, everyone? Um, I just want to put my computer on this side. Sorry, one sec. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Liam Quinn. I'm the Youth Programs Director at the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health, um, and I'm the lead staff person for our Teens Lead at Work program. I want to, again, thank um, and say that I'm thrilled that I was joined by a bunch of our peer leaders today, and thank you, Johan, for speaking so clearly about what students need. Um, and we are here to say that the student voice is organized and ready to be heard by BPS decision makers. Um, through their work at T-Law, Teens Lead at Work, our young people have partnered with youth from St. Stephen's programs, St. Stephen's youth programs, facilitated workshops for students across the city, and we've reached dozens of students and counting with our new student for student BPS survey. Um, and by reflecting on their uh, experiences at BPS, by talking to their fellow students and surveying them, they have distilled the problems that they face as students. Um, a couple of these, I'm gonna pass out the one pager, um, but that a concerning percentage of students feel that they're not prepared for their college and future careers. Students do not have enough or any access to mental health supports or adults they trust. Students are stressed by the demands of the school system. Many schools are understaffed and teachers are under supported. And the solutions that they proposed were clean, renovated school buildings, included regulated class temperatures, HVAC, outdoor space, renewable energy, and and clean bathrooms that are gender and disability accessible, expanded mental health, career, college, and life counseling, and expanded school amenities like libraries, gyms, science labs, mental health and wellness spaces, art, mu art and music spaces, and natural light. I also do want to add that something that they, whoops, that they mentioned was that school locations have access to internships, youth and family services, and public transportation, I think is so important when designing schools from the bottom up. And this is just a summary, but we're here to request that the school committee hear the full presentation that our young people have um, on November 15th. We have a final presentation. We have a bunch of data, and I think that the school committee needs to hear it, and we would love to have the chance for, for our young people to give their full presentation. So Thank, Thank you, you, Liam. We'll be in touch with you. Oh, if, do you all want these? Yes, yes please. please. <laughs> <'Cause it's so laughs> okay, that concludes our, our in-person testimony. We'll now transition to virtual testimony. Please make sure you're signed into Zoom with the same name that you used to sign up for public comment and be prepared to unmute yourself and turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. Please raise your hand virtually when I call your name. Jawan Skeens, Mike Heishman, Martha McLaughlin, Monica Borgita, and Deirdre Manning. Please raise your hands virtually. Jawan? Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Can you please turn on your camera for us? One second. Uh, technology is just playing with me. Give me one second, everybody. So um, I'm currently trying to pull over, so I won't go on camera at this time, but I will say just a few words. Uh, my name is Jawan Skeens. I'm a writing candidate for Boston City Council at large. I am a Boston Public School graduate from the Joseph Lee School in Dorchester, the Tumulty Middle School in Roxbury, which is now closed, and South Boston Excel High School. Um, I, you know, pardon me right now because my voice is a little shaky because I just lost my best friend 16 years ago when we were in the process of graduating Tumulty Middle School. So I, I'm, I'm still, you know, my heart is a little heavy. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you all for what you do to um, take care of our, our, our kids. Um, but I know that there's a lot more work to do. And one of those things that I would like to see um, is that, um, you know, we are definitely prioritizing the mental health of, of our students, uh, making sure that, you know, we are giving them the support and services that they need, uh, whether there's nurses or social workers or um, whoever's there that can be supportive um, in, in nurturing their mental health. It's essential as they're losing their best friends at a young age. Um, the next thing um, is in, in regards to 
programming. I was the junior varsity debate champion of the Boston Debate League, as well as the uh, senior class president of my student body. Uh, we need to be encouraging our kids um, to uh, be more interactive with after school programming um, so that way they are staying out of harm's way. Um, and uh, we need to be also increasing access to um, college as well as careers. Now that all of our kids want to go to college right away. Some of them need to get into the union construction trades. Um, I would recommend that become a citywide program uh, for our kids um, to make sure that they're able to make livable wages. Um, and the last note that I will make is I want to make sure that we are um, you know, pulling from as many resources as possible when it comes to funding our Boston public schools. Mr. Skeens, I mean thank you. I'm afraid you're at your time. I've been testifying at the Cannabis Control Commission. Thank you, Mr. Skeens. Our next speaker is Mike Heishman. Mike Heishman, Beja, Dorchester. Our community has a right to know how our public officials make decisions. Too often this body makes important decisions behind locked doors. Ms. Skipper and, the board, and this board pretends to be anti-racist. Too often you support white supremacy. At our last meeting, Chair Robinson angrily proclaimed that she had Superintendent Skipper's back and was critical of the naysayers who failed to offer solutions. Ms. Skipper gave Chair Robinson a standing ovation. Nowhere does your bylaws say that the school committee should have the superintendent's back. It does say the school committee is responsible for the oversight of the superintendent. Over a year ago, Ms. Skipper had received a letter from 15 high-ranking retired BPS educators of color protesting against the targeting and harassment of, and firing of anti-racist black and brown central office leaders. This serious allegation of racism deserves an independent investigation and not one controlled by Ms. Skipper, the accused. Where is your supervision? Instead, you chose to silently support Ms. Skipper's back. The past few months, you have been silent about the Wolf Skipper plan to move the O'Brien exam school from the heart of the African-American community to White West Roxbury. No supervision, no criticism, once again, you support your leaders back. No organization in our city has been more outspoken at these meetings than the members of the Boston Education Justice Alliance. Please stop giving us hundreds of reasons seconds. for being naysayers. However, Chair Robinson, you are wrong. Bezier has offered for years progressive solutions. The Bezier pledge is included at the end of my testimony. There is a list of 20 solutions. Since Chair Robinson wants solutions, I ask her permission to extend my time so I can read them. Would that be okay, Chair Robinson? Mr. Heishman, I'm afraid you're at your time, but please send well, I'm out of time. I'm proud of Bezier. I don't expect a standing ovation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Martha McLaughlin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I'm in the car. Um, my name is Martha McLaughlin. I live in Charlestown, and I am the BPS parent of four students at the Elliott School. Um, I am sort of changing what I was going to say based on what was already said today, but I guess um, one thing I want to say is that my two oldest girls, Elizabeth and Grace, are in seventh and eighth grade at the Elliott. Um, despite their perfect GPAs, despite their MAP scores in the high 90s, they did not get admitted to any exam school. Um, we know this data we've seen a million times already tonight is that tier seven had a 0% chance um, from our tier going to a non-bonus point school. So my children were mathematically excluded from Boston Latin School. Um, you say you want to wait for another year or two of data. I have two years of data. I have two children who did not get in despite being extremely qualified. To wait another year or two to see the trend continue eliminates their chance of an exam school entirely. My eighth grader would be applying to Boston Latin for ninth grade this year. As of now, she has a 0% chance of getting in if this policy remains. 
I don't have a year to wait for this data to be reassessed a third time. I have two years of data that show that this policy is inequitable, it is unethical, and it is targeted. Um, so the two changes that I think we should make, one is the bonus points, I won't get into that too much. Um, they're not helpful. They're um, irrelevant in the lower tiers and they're exclusive in the upper tiers. Um, one suggestion I had might be to use mass health data for that. Uh, mass health is vetted income data from the state um, that you know identifies low income families. That's a possibility. The second point um, that Kathleen made much more eloquently is to reassign the tiers by applicants. Um, if we had this equal number of applicants per tier, not students per tier, but applicants per tier, and those are not the same, and allocated 12.5% of the seats per tier, that would allow for more equitable access per tier. This, as of now, as we're seeing, the tiers one through six have 100% um, acceptance rate, regardless of score. Um, tier seven and eight, it's below 50%. And that number is not even first choice school, that's any exam school seat. So my two suggestions are, you know, get rid of the points or make them to individually qualified students based on income. Um, and number two is to reallocate the tiers by applicants. And that would make Thank this you. policy more equitable, um, more fair. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monica Borgita. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me and hear me. Can, can you confirm? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi. So I'm um, here tonight as a parent of the Boston Public School District. I have two kids at the Elliott and I, I live in Charlestown. Um, I'm here most of all because not necessarily just because my kids go to the Elliott and uh, I'm a parent of the Boston Public School District, but mostly because I want to be an advocate for public education. I hear a lot of assumptions and I also decided to change a little bit of the, the list of ideas that I had planned uh, for tonight based on what I heard in the first hour, hour and a half of uh, this meeting. Uh, I have two great concerns. One, I would um, like to invite the newest members of the school committee and I thank everybody for their work, but I would invite the newest member of the school committee to go back and look at the recordings and the documents for the first few meetings. Uh, the origin of the 10 bonus points was never clear. Um, I attended all the meetings of the task force and those 10 bonus points, bonus points emerged at the end and not clearly. So I think that we should revisit that decision and the overall criteria and rationale behind it. I'm also a big advocate of revisiting the number of seats allocated for each tier. I also believe that this is not just and um, equitable if we look at the not only the, the applicants, but the population overall uh, across the tiers. So. Uh, there are uh, small actions that uh, we do not have time to wait for. I think that the committee should be accountable and transparent in addressing those points and uh, have more conversations. So I think there are so many people that are participating, but we would like to, yeah, as taxpayers, as citizens, I'm also an immigrant, but I would like to see more action and less uh, talk. And again, our kids especially do not have time to wait. Uh, there, is, there are issues related to mental health that I also heard tonight, as I also observed in my house and with my friends. Uh, so I think that also these issues would have to be addressed beyond uh, race and socioeconomic diversity and everything else. I'm waiting for answers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Deidre Manning, followed by Mano Katsumpanakis, Shirley Chen Wen, and Tova Francois. If you could please raise your hands <coughs> virtually. Deidre Manning. Good evening. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Deirdre Manning. I'm a resident of Dorchester, a public servant, a single parent, and sole supporter for two minor children. We have been members of the BPS community since 2016. Unfortunately, my older daughter needed to leave Boston Public Schools because of the free fall of what happened at the Henderson after our principal was assaulted and knocked unconscious. I agree with everything that's been said before about children, 11 year olds specifically, being caught in a bureaucratic nightmare. When I worked for the Department of Public Utilities, I led the effort to automate the um, enrollment of the low income discount rate for people who received public benefits. I can assure you it is a very simple process to do data matching with people who are on public benefit rolls with the address and the names of families who are applicants for the exam school. I would strongly encourage the school committee to stop 
discriminating against 11 year old children who have no fault at all with being caught up in this bureaucratic nightmare and automate the process of allocating 10 points directly to families and students in need. There are far too many children who will suffer irreparable harm by being caught up in this bureaucracy through no fault of their own. Please make a change to stop what I consider to be an extremely unfair process. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mano Katsampanakis. Madam Chair, um, committee members, Superintendent Skipper, 100.2, a number that uh, we heard a lot uh, tonight. You know how hard it is uh, not to be angry at you for willing to continue with this policy as it is? This is my daughter you're talking about. First, you call her an unintended consequence. She's a human, and now proof that all her hard work was for nothing? You know she waited for weeks for the invitations to come out, hoping for a good result, believing, and all along she stood no chance, zero? And for what? For an admissions policy that uh, is equitable? No, it's a mess. There's houses in tiers five and six that are worth double than what our house is worth in tier seven. T 10 points allocated to entire student bodies. Here's a fact about this. There's 209 low income students in my daughter's school that get nothing from you. One mile away, there's another elementary school, one mile where 309 affluent students receive 10 bonus points from you, and you're willing to continue this for more years? Shameful, shameful. Thank you, Mano. Our next speaker is Shirley Chen Wang. Shirley, we be using Cantonese interpretation this evening. Shirley, I'll bond you Great. Uh, Thank you. Please begin. We have our interpreter ready. Shirley, you can say something. Yeah. Cole, you are Shirley, ma. 我不是啊，我不知道为什么他把我放过来，我不是，但是我可以讲话，我可以自己讲吗？你可以讲英文吗？还是需要翻译？讲英文我不需要翻译，我讲好了，好不好？OK，好，你可以讲。So okay, okay, she does not need interpreting. She can speak in English. 应该搞错了，无所谓，好吧？Hi, uh, hi. My name is um Nicole. So I just want here to testify. My, I have moved to Boston, Beacon Hill, for the past ten years, just because I wanted my child to go to exam school. So she actually get points, 100 points. She was in private school for elementary school. And because of the changes, we never experienced because COVID changed the policy maker and it didn't add any points for the for the private school. And it's just very unfair for the private school kids even get 100 points doesn't get a, any get any chance to get in the private school, uh, get into exam school. And it's just very unfair for the children. And we have pain so much just because we are trying to have a have a better education for the kids. And the, the policy maker, the people who work for the school and who made it who made it the points 
to add it to the school instead of people with no no income, and just add, decide whichever the school don't give them the points. That's very unfair. So I want to just change ASAP. So because my children, my child wait until another two years now in the private school for, for middle school, I want to have I want him have a chance to get into the high school. Maybe there's there's some chance when they've been tier eight, and because of this. And we get no chance to get into the school. And also, I don't know why. I mean, the this, this policymaker who told, made this is not, like, I see a lot of parents experience the same thing, especially for tier seven yes, and tier eight. And all the good kids, because the policymaker just want to push them, everyone, to send them the kids to the private school, which is very hard. We are the taxpayer, and we are trying to make the city better to make everyone's life is better instead of just, I mean, that's, that's just, I wanted the policymakers, you, the committee, Nicole. whoever, look into the bonus points. Thank you. Over your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tova Francois, followed by Michelle White, Ruby Reyes, Nathaniel Adams, and Juan Gali. If you can please raise your hands virtually. Tova? Hi, how are you? Good evening. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, I have my timer on, so I believe we have two minutes. So my name is Tova Francois. Um, I have been working with EPS for 14 years, going on 15. Um, I am also a bus monitor, and um, we have been told to switch from getting paid $27 an hour to $19. I mean, $27 um, a run to now getting paid $19 an hour. Um, not all of us are getting paid by hourly. We're getting paid for a run, and um, we're not getting paid really at all. And honestly, it's a slap in our face. Um, we were being tricked, honestly, to switching to $19. A lot of us did not vote for that, and we're not getting paid. Some people were getting paid $200 and $15. Um, like, how are we supposed to survive for two weeks? How are we supposed to make it for two weeks? It's not okay. We have 75 year olds who are working on a bus with kids by themselves. Like it's, and then some of them have to work to get health insurance. They have to work six runs. That's not fair. It's not fair at all. People are getting abused on the bus by kids and we're not getting compensated by it. I think it's really wrong. And I think things need to be changed and things need to, be fixed by it I, it's just it's just unacceptable it's wrong people are working very hard just to survive and i think like it needs to be fixed something needs to change and things just it just needs to change it's just unacceptable and it's wrong it's really wrong and things need to change things really need to change so that's just my complaint on tonight and i feel bad for all the other stuff that's happening but this is definitely a, a big complaint when it comes to the bus monitors it's a really disgrace to all of us. So I hope this, this change. Have a good night. Thank you, Tova. <coughs> Our next speaker is Michelle White. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, good evening. I'm. My name is Michelle White. I live in Mattapan. I have a student who has multiple disabilities who goes to the school in the, at the Blackstone in the South End. My major concern started at the start of the school year when my son did not gain access to his school due to transportation issues with the driver not wanting to pick him up door to door. I had to send out a lot of emails, make a lot of phone calls. And my student has door-to-door -door transportation. There was no access issue. It was a bus driver who was ignorant, dismissive, and a bully. I am at my wit's end. My son has now been on a bus by himself, going to school by himself, coming home from school by himself. It's a bus that seats 12 walkers and four wheelchairs. He's missing out on his inclusion. 
He's missing out on engaging with students. He's missing out on how to navigate a bus with other students. The problem was rectified, but these resources are being wasted. To have one child transported to school, transported back home by himself does not solve the problem. It's just a Band-Aid solution. Band-Aid solution promotes more problems. It opens up more sores. There are other children who have access issues to getting home, having to wait at school for 45 minutes for a bus to come and take them home. Again, these are children with multiple disabilities. These are children who have access issues to begin with, and then not to be able to get to school and get home in a timely manner due to some stipulations of drivers not wanting to do the Thank job you, because they have that option of not doing it. Thank you. For whatever Thank you. their I'm guidelines Thank are. Thank you. I'm afraid you're at your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ruby Reyes. My name is Ruby Reyes, and I'm the executive director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and Dorchester resident. I want to encourage the school committee members to read the equity planning tool and begin using it for the votes you take and the decisions you make. The equity planning tool includes questions such as, what is the proposal, its desired outcomes, and impact on traditionally marginalized communities, such as Blacks, Latinx, EL, and special ed students and their families? How are they most impacted? How have Blacks? Latinx, EL, special ed, and economically disadvantaged students, families, staff, and other key internal and external stakeholders been engaged in encouraging and shaping this proposal? Who are the stakeholders most impacted by this proposal? And how have we involved them from those historically marginalized communities in developing the proposal? What has our engagement told us about the potential positive or negative impacts of the proposal for different groups and how this proposal might produce or perpetuate racial inequity. This school committee has already voted to close schools through merger. You have passed a budget that has placed over 610 staff under ESSER funding, which will run out this year. You did this without a plan to replace these positions. Do you ask yourselves these questions when you make these decisions? Did you ask yourselves which schools the 610 staff under ESSER funding are going to be cut from? Did you ask yourselves what the impact of closing and merging schools would have on students who are majority Black, Latinx, English learner, and students with disabilities at those schools? Are you asking yourselves what moving the O'Brien School, the most racially and neurodiverse of the exam schools, is going to have when you move to a majority white community that will cut off access to the T, partnerships, and resource? The equity planning tool on the rare occasions they, that they are completed are often filled out without being able to answer these questions. As a school committee, you are supposed to represent the best interests of BPS students in providing a high quality education. At the very least, take responsibility for when you feed structural racism repeatedly Thank you, by ev passing everything put before you and without- Thank you, I'm afraid you're at your time. Our next speaker is Nathaniel Adams. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, uh, my name is Nathaniel Adams. I'm a resident of West Roxbury. Um, I want to speak on the O'Brien uh, issue, but first a quick point on the exam school discussion. I would just point out that all of the concerns that have been uh, raised tonight were both foreseen and articulated by members of the community before the policy was adopted, uh, both at the task force and at the school committee. Um, so I think the idea that you need to wait for additional data just to confirm what was sort of obvious to people who had common sense uh, is sort of laughable. Um, on the O'Brien, I do hope that the committee will um, really listen to the members of the O'Brien community who are opposed to the move. Um, it is clearly going to be extremely disruptive. And to me, it sounds like a policy or a plan that promises concrete harm to that community with um, potentially to be offset by some theoretical benefits. And in, in the interest of being productive, I do have an alternative proposed use for that site, which would be to turn it into an open enrollment high school 
there is no such high school on this side of the city other than um, English, which is a bit of a hike from West Roxbury. But if you turn it into an open enrollment school along the lines of East Boston High School, where priority admission would be given first to residents of West Roxbury and potentially Rosendale, then to any resident from the city who qualified for an exam school but did not receive an invitation, and then the rest of the seats would be open to any other applicants of the school. Um, and I think by doing that, you would end up with a school that is truly open enrollment, but has a strong foundation of um, academically um, strong students and families who are extremely vested both in the school community and in the surrounding area. And you would also not be uh, forcing the disruption of an entire existing school community. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Our final speaker is Juan Gali. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, my name is Juan Gali. Uh, I am a parent of a tier seven neighborhood, and uh, I have a daughter at a BLS school that did not receive bonus points. So I guess you know what I'm going to speak about. Um, like others have said, I want to echo what others have said about the inequality of the admissions uh, policy, especially for grades seven and eight. Um, there are many ways to address this issue. Uh, we've, we've heard about some of them, but I just wanted to uh, speak about one of them, and that is allocating the number of seats um, to VLS schools based on the number of applicants. I don't see any downside to this, to this um, remedy. Uh, I can only see advantages, so I don't know why the committee wouldn't adopt this change right now. I think you you all want to see yourselves as a committee that is able to adapt as the data is uh, revealed. So uh, to set an example, uh, why why wouldn't you make it, make a change that has no downsides right now um, into next year? So those seventh grade kids that were affected can actually get a seat on a on a on a on an exam school in ninth grade. Um, that's what I wanted to raise. I, I, I don't know how many more times uh, you're going to have to hear this until the change is made. I hope it's not too many. Thanks again. Have a good night. Thank you. Chair Robinson, that concludes our speakers for public comment. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And thank you to those of you who spoke this evening and shared your perspectives. Your testimony is very important to us. <clears throat> our first section item this evening is grants for approval totaling $6,435 thousand seven hundred and sixty six dollars I will now open it up to the committee for questions and comments uh, just one comment um, I appreciate the the more detail that um, has been provided uh, like in this I have a better sense of the intention of each one but more or less like the measurement and then how I think what we still need to think about is how we're revisiting afterward and sort of uh, hearing presentations and making sure that those are getting on the dockets for us so that we can see uh, progress uh, investments um, but uh, I certainly appreciate um, the, the the level of detail that's gone into at least here so, thank you no um, not a question just a comment in particular about the CBH m1. I want to um, thank the folks from um, Children's Hospital mm -hmm. and UMass Boston. This is a national model we have here, and we're now up to, I think the grant says 78 of our schools, right, where we're using the comprehensive <laughs> behavioral health model. And the fact that this partnership we have with the city, uh, with uh, Children's Hospital and with UMass Boston is incredible and um, I was really glad to read and also see the details thank you dr. Elkins for pushing on asking for the details of specifically what it's going to be used for and what we're expecting the outcomes to be on but this is such a cr critical issue the mental health of our students and we have literally a nationally leading model because of two incredible partners and I, ju I just wanted to call that out 
anything else? Thank you. Uh, and if there's no further discussion, I will now entertain a motion to approve the grants as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Is there any objection to approving the grants by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the grants are approved. Our next action item are four collective bargaining items. You'll recall that at our last meeting, Labor Relations Director Jeremiah Hassan presented to the committee two memoranda of agreements between the Boston Public School Committee and the Plants Administrators Association. A fiscal year 24 supplemental appropriation request to the Boston City Council in the amount of $145,545 to support the cost of the agreements <clears throat> and a side letter of agreement to amend the collective bargaining agreement between Boston School Committee and the Boston Association of Administrators and Supervisors, also known as BASIS. I will now invite the superintendent to offer final comments. Oh, wonderful, thank you, Chair. Uh, so just as I, I shared the last time, these are two units, one very small. Um, but very mighty uh, in the Plant Administrators Association. They have 16 employees, um, but they <clears throat> they do so much in the oversight <clears throat> of the custodial services and the groundkeeping um, at all 125 of our buildings. Um, they also, um, with the administrative buildings, do the same supports. They, uh, they help to uh, work with and supervise our custodians, the 500 custodians we celebrated earlier, and they just do an amazing job. So um, I would ask in favor of the vote for you. Um, also for BPS BASIS, BASIS is <coughs> a unit that represents our supervisors and directors. They're throughout our schools, um, and once again, we rely on them heavily. They're everything from our assistant principals to directors of instruction uh, to critical positions within special education. Um, so I would ask the committee tonight in, to vote in favor of both of these. Thank you, Superintendent. I'll now open it up to the committee for final questions or comments on collective bargaining. Any questions? No? Yes. All righty. So if there's no further discussion, okay, thank you. Now the committee will take a series of votes, yeah. one on each item. If there's no further discussion, I'll now entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Boston School Committee and the Plant Administrators Association covering the period from September 1, 2020 to August 31st, 2023 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved to. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. <coughs> Thank you. I will now entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Boston School Committee and the Plant Administrators Association covering the period from September 1, 2023 to August 31st, 2026 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion to approve a fiscal year 24 supplemental appropriation request to the Boston City Council in the amount of $145,545 to support the memorandum of agreement between the Boston School Committee and the Plant Administrators Association September 1st, 2023 through August 31st, 2026. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion to approve the side letter of agreement to amend the collective bargaining agreement between Boston School Committee and the Boston Association of School Administrators and Supervisors, also known as BASIS. Is there a motion? 
So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Our final action item this evening is a Horace Mann in district charter amendment request for Boston Green Academy to reconfigure its grade span from 6 to 12 to grade 7 to 12. You will recall that at our last meeting, BGA Head of School Matt Holzer and Governing Board Chair Alex Chu presented this charter amendment request, which aligns with the district's grade configuration strategy policy. I will now invite the superintendent to offer final comments. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so tonight I'd ask you to vote in favor and to approve Boston Green Academy's charter amendment. Um, this is a request to change their grade configuration from 6 to 12 to 7 to 12. Um, I want to thank and recognize Matt Holzer, the school leader, uh, who is in the audience tonight. <clears throat> this is certainly in alignment with BPS's uh, move toward a reduction of the number of grades um, and a link to the 7 to 12 configuration. So I would ask you to vote in favor. Thank you, Superintendent. I'll now open it up to the committee for final questions or comments. Madam Chair, Sorry. just um, only because I was not able to be That's here last right. week yes. due to travel, and I, I assume Mr. Holzer, head of school Holzer, presented last week. And mm -hmm. if I had been here, I would have said thank you for doing this to align better with the district. Um, appreciate all that's going on at Green Academy. I had a little bit of preview since we talked about this at your graduation in June on a scorching hot day at mm -hmm. White Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, thank you for better aligning the school with um, the district's configuration as well. And um, just want to say that. Great, thank you. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the Horace Mann in district charter amendment request for Boston Green Academy to reconfigure its grade span to grades 7 to 12 starting in school year 24 25 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our main report this evening is a presentation of the 2023 State Assessment and Accountability Results. I will now invite April Clarkson, Senior Executive Director, Office of Data and Accountability, to please step forward with the presentation. While she's getting settled, I'd like to invite the superintendent to give opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so as you remember, uh, on two, um, I presented the last time uh, at the last school committee meeting that on Tuesday, September 19th, uh, DESE released the 2023 accountability results for schools and districts across the state. And the uh, SY2223 Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System, or data, which we call MCAS. Uh, tonight, our team will present a full report on this data. As I stated last week, uh, BPS is making progress toward its targets. In the state's accountability system, the district was not identified as requiring assistance or intervention and was deemed to be making substantial progress toward targets. Uh, in fact, BPS met 51% of its improvement targets, and the district earned the same rating as 141 other districts in the state. The district also uh, exceeded, and I'm very proud of this, exceeded targets for reducing chronic absenteeism in all grade levels and demonstrated typical growth in ELA and math in all grade levels. And I think the chronic absenteeism was a particular point where nationally we see that going in the wrong direction and even locally and through a lot of hard work on the team, um, we've been able to reduce that. Uh, as I noted last week, 53 schools across the district were identified as not requiring assistance or intervention. Four schools were named schools of recognition or were identified by DESE as having met or exceeded their targets and at high achievement and growth. Those schools were the Tynan and Perry in South Boston and JFK and Manning in Jamaica Plain. This data provides the district with information that will guide us as we continue to support students and schools in making up the lost time during the pandemic. We continue to stabilize, and as we stabilize and recover, I expect to see more rapid improvement. I'm very encouraged by the strong progress that we see in math, 
particularly with our students with disabilities and former English learners. Our regional model allows school superintendents to really dig into the MCAS data and analyze it with teachers at the school level. This will help us ensure that individual schools are getting the support that they need. This school year is the year that we will see these new systems begin to bear results as they gain more traction. We have to keep our focus on closing not only the gaps created by the pandemic, <coughs> but also the persistent gaps for our most marginalized students, our black and brown students, our special education and our multilingual learners with and with, um, without disability. So with this, I'll turn it over to our uh, wonderful uh, Dr. Eccleson and April Clarkson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to begin by thanking April Clarkson. Many of you know she's the Senior Executive Director of the Office of Data and Accountability. She also happens to be one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with, so I just want to thank her for all of her work. I also want to thank members of the team who will be here this evening just potentially to answer some questions you might have. I think um, the, the, the analysis that I think we'll share tonight tells a very clear and compelling story um, and some very obvious um, next steps for the district, and I'm sure there's a lot to dig into. I also just want to thank the chair for her continued commitment to a deep focus on student outcomes. There is no more important work in the VPS, and I think the story that we're going to share tonight, while there are some wins, and, and I appreciate the superintendent for naming some of those, it also tells a very uncomfortable story about the work that we have ahead, um, and I think we have to confront that, and we have to accelerate progress for our students, particularly students we have not served well. Um, I think that will be very apparent in this analysis, um, and we hope that we'll be able to dig in not only tonight, but also to continue this conversation as we move forward. The main story this evening, uh, from our perspective, are four really clear takeaways. At the most broad level, um, BPS was determined to be making substantial progress toward goals. Um, that 51%, uh, we, sorry, that made substantial progress toward targets. Um, just to give that to context, about 36% of schools across the Commonwealth made progress toward targets. And in context to other urban school districts, um, Brockton was at 46%, Lawrence at 45%, Lowell at 39%, Lynn at 34%, and Worcester at 41%. So while as a district, we do not require assistance or intervention, we also need to acknowledge that the type of progress we expect to see at our schools is not apparent everywhere. And in fact, the number of schools requiring assistance or intervention has increased to 44 schools. We saw greater gains in mathematics than we did in, in literacy. And our general analysis is that math performance is rebounding and more work is needed to accelerate outcomes in literacy, which I'm sure we'll talk about this evening. We will introduce compelling evidence of the correlation between chronic absenteeism and student performance. And that fourth, the patterns in English language development that we see in, um, across the state mirror the patterns in BPS. While we find that many of our, st our students in grades one to four, in grades one to four made strong progress in English language development, that same accelerated progress was not seen at the secondary level and for our students at English language development levels one and two. April will walk us through some MCAS data. I will then walk us through some access data and then we'll talk about some immediate next steps that the BPS is committing to. Thank you. We'll start with the accountability data. 2023 marks the return to the state's full accountability system for the first time since 2019. District accountability encompasses an overall classification as well as the percent of improvement targets that the district is making progress towards. School accountability consists of a normative accountability percentile, which ranks that school against all schools in the state that serve a similar grade span of students. The school accountability system also includes a criterion reference component that's similar to the district accountability system that describes the percent of improvement targets that the school has made progress towards. As a reminder, the Massachusetts accountability system assesses school performance on more than just student achievement. Rather, the system includes MCAS achievement and growth indicators, high school completion indicators that include graduation and dropout rates, as well as extended engagement rates, progress towards English proficiency, 
reduction in chronic absenteeism, and advanced coursework completion for all schools that serve 11th and 12th grade students. As Drew alluded to in the beginning of this presentation, the first major takeaway is that BPS is classified by the state as not requiring assistance or intervention because it's making substantial progress towards its accountability targets. On average, BPS has made progress in 51% of the state's improvement targets as compared to all districts statewide whose target improvement rate is 36%. We can also see here in this table that BPS um, has the same classification as 141 other districts within the state. <coughs> Looking under the hood, we start to see where the district has made improvements since the last full accountability cycle. The district has doubled the number of schools of recognition, and we celebrate the strides that have been made by the Joseph P. Tynan, the John F. Kennedy, Oliver Hazard Perry, and Joseph P. Manning schools. However, while we celebrate the success of these schools, we also note the decline in the rate of schools that are meeting or exceeding targets the decline of schools that are making substantial or moderate progress towards target improvements. We also note the rise in the percentage of schools that are requiring assistance or intervention by the state. The changes in the ratings across BPS schools leads us to note the variation in performance that we are seeing in our schools. At the high end, the district celebrated seven schools whose accountability percentile increased by 10 percentile points or more. We also note that two of these seven schools are transformation schools. At the other end, we note that there are five schools whose accountability percentile dropped by 10 or more points, taking care to note that none of those were our transformation schools. We'll now turn to our MCAS achievement results. Overall, we note that math achievement has increased at both the three to eight and high school levels. However, the scores are still below the accountability targets that are set out by the state and below the 2019 achievement levels. As for ELA achievement, we note that three to eight performance declined by 0 0.3 scaled score points, while high school performance increased by 1.2 scaled score points. Both of these results are still below the accountability targets and the 2019 levels. Slide 12 visually represents the three to eight performance over the past three test administrations. The y-axis represents the range of scores possible from 440 to 560. The orange line describes the average proficiency mark on the MCAS. Scores above 500 represent meeting and exceeding expectations. The blue bars show district performance in the years of 2019, 2022, and 2023, whereas the orange bar is the 2023 achievement target that's set out by the state in each subject. This chart ch shows two main takeaways. Across each subject area, the decline experience since 2019 has stopped. In ELA, there was a 0.3 point decrease while math experienced a 0.8 point increase. However, these 2023 performances have not met the 2019 levels, they have not met the achievement targets, and are still well below the um, proficiency mark of 500. Slide 13 shows a reverse trend to the previous slide, um, whereas at the <coughs> high school level, we see an increase in ELA performance and a decrease in math performance. We also see that the averages are closer to both the accountability targets as well as the proficiency line of 500. The following slides will show the detailed breakdown of results by grade level and student group. When looking at the three to eight math scores, we can see little variation by grade level and, perf um, and performance gaps by student race and lower than average performance by student disability and English language status. Most notably, and what we'll see across the remaining slides, is um, a consistent underperformance for students in grade seven, as well as for English learners with disabilities. Slide 16 shows that although math performance on average improved um, year over year and across most grade levels and student groups, we see improvement we do see decreases in performance for grade seven students and English learners with disabilities. 
What I would like to highlight is despite the performance decreases for these two groups, the average student growth percentile for these groups and for all groups is in the typical range of 40 to 60. This means that compared to similar students across the state, students in Boston experience typical growth in math achievement. Slide 17 shows the comparative performance um, in three to eight ELA. And here we call out the similar underperformance in grade seven and for English learners with disabilities. Um, moving to the next slide, we see that um, although many student groups um, and grade levels de declined in the ELA um, three to eight performance, Grade seven students and English learners with disabilities experienced the largest decreases. However, similar to the previous table for math performance, we see typical growth levels for those student groups. The next two slides look at grade 10 results and I'm gonna move through them very quickly. Um, what we can see is an increase um, in ELA scores, we'll see a decrease in math scores, and we'll see varied performance across student groups, unlike what we saw at the three to eight level. And the last MCAS slide that I'm gonna share with you, and there are additional slides in the appendix, really describes what the superintendent was, was discussing before. Um, there is a clear correlation between chronic absenteeism and performance that we're seeing in our schools. The chart in front of you is a bubble chart. On the x-axis, we see the um, chronic absenteeism rate for 2023 for each school. On the y-axis, we see the percent of students meeting or exceeding expectations on the three to eight math test. This is a bubble chart, which means that the size of the circles that you see are representative of the size of the testing population for each school. Each, bu each bubble or circle represents a school. As you read this chart from left to right, as we're, go we're increasing in the chronic absenteeism rate for schools, so as chronic absenteeism increases from zero to 100%, we see the percent of students meeting or exceeding expectations decreasing. We have visually imposed this orange vertical line just to show you that at about that 42% rate for chronic absenteeism, you can see a difference in what's happening with the school, um, the school relationship with um, chronic absenteeism and performance. Whereas on the left side of the, of the orange line, you'll see at about like 38%, the school's performance on the MCAS ranges from about 0% to just under 50%. So with the same chronic absenteeism rate, you see a wide variation in performance. To the right of the orange line, we don't see that as much anymore. So we see it's going probably zero to about 20, 22%, with the exception of that like green and pink, um, those green and pink schools that we see there. And we see this consistent pattern for ELA and for our high school scores as well, those are in the appendices, but it's showing us that attendance does matter and what we see across the different um, charts that we've done of this, that it especially matters in math. Thank you, April. <clears throat> for context, ACCESS is an assessment intended to measure progress toward English language development for multilingual learners and those students are assessed in four domains speaking, listening, reading, and writing. There was a graph here, I apologize. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the, one of the, the key findings that we, that we um, came to after analyzing our access data um, was that um, that we continue to see a large number of our English language learners scoring at the third English language development level. We find, uh, as this chart shows, um, that uh, students uh, that are ELD ones and twos are showing less progress than students at levels three, four, and five 
who are far more likely to make progress in their English language development level. We find that since 2020, the percentage of students scoring in level four has decreased by seven points. We also find that students at ELD levels three, four, and five were more likely to make progress than the students at ELD levels one and two. It's also interesting to note that students at grades one through five are, are making more progress as compared to our secondary students. Mm -hmm. You'll see that there is a dip from grade four to five and then relatively low progress for students in grades six to 12. There's a few points that we wanna make uh, relative to the district response from a policy and system-wide set of practices. One, for far too long, there has been far too much variation across BPS schools. When I previously worked in the district, I've often called our approach in the past to literacy, let a thousand flowers bloom. That is not a clear district strategy around how to increase literacy for students across the BPS. We have finally made a concerted and dedicated effort toward what ought to be true in every school that is consistent with what the research says about the science of reading. We call these things for the first time universal expectations. They're a set of practices that we should expect to see in all schools. There's also an expectation, I think for the first time, that all schools across the system are demonstrating continuous improvement toward uh, progress goals that we'll talk about in a few slides, specifically around um, implementation of equitable literacy, around culture and climate, and around attendance. We also, I think the, the, this, the bubble graph that April showed is one of the most compelling pieces of information to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Students need to be in school. We, have, uh, uh, we need to continue to engage, and I know that um, Chief Kelton is here this evening and some of her colleagues to talk about the importance of attendance campaigns. We need to ensure that our students are in school. We need to leverage the resources that the superintendent has committed to our BPS schools to ensure that those resources are supporting kids getting to school and getting to school on time. We have made as part of our progress, which I'll speak about in the next slide or two, quarterly reviews where we are having conversations with school leaders about their progress toward the universal expectations. And one of those things we're monitoring very explicitly uh, is each school's progress toward improvements in chronic absenteeism. The other thing that keeps me up at night relative to this information is what we perceive to be expanded inequities around school achievement. Schools that have historically performed above the district average are continuing to perform above the district average and improve their performance. And some of our schools that are not yet performing uh, at or above the, the district average are in some cases continuing to decline. I want to acknowledge, and, and April alluded to this earlier in the presentation, we've seen some significant improvement in our transformation schools, in some cases some pretty rapid and accelerated improvement. But we're very concerned that we have not kept our eye in a coordinated way on schools that are currently in the 10th and 20th percentile. Those schools have not historically received the level of support and oversight and uh, guidance at the schoolhouse um, that some of our transformation schools have. And we have to um, change our policies and our practices to ensure that those schools are provided the support that they need to continuously improve. There it is. <laughs> Somehow it got out of order. There was a slide there I was going to talk about. <laughs> um, one, one thing that um, April and her team um, have created that we just wanted to highlight um, is an MCAS dashboard that's available for all schools and all educators across our system. And so this happens to be just sort of images from that dashboard. Um, and what you see on the left um, is a set of test items from MCAS. Um, it tells you what the correlated standard is. It gives you a sense of what that test item is and it tells you how your school did relative to sort of state averages um, and state comparisons on specific test items. So you can begin to look for patterns and trends, um, particularly around um, sort of um, high leverage standards. So in math, like major work of the grade, 
or in literacy, key ideas and details, for example. Um, and you're also able to compare your work uh, on individual test items and individual standards um, to both state and district averages. <clears throat> Earlier I talked about the importance of a set of universal expectations. And uh, this is something that we've been talking about and we've really centered uh, in our work with school leaders um, over the last six months or so. Uh, this was a collaborative process um, to define what ought to be true in every BPS school. And so it starts with an expectation that all schools across BPS are making progress <coughs> in a set of outcome evidence. And we've intentionally aligned those uh, examples of outcome evidence to each school's quality school priority. So each of our schools is expected to set a set of priorities relative to equitable literacy, culture and climate, and attendance. And we identify in the lighter blue box the actual indicators and metrics that we are monitoring as a system to ensure that our schools are making progress in equitable literacy, culture and climate, and attendance. And it's important, and I often, in, in April and I both, talk about this often with the teams that we work with. It is, it is critically important from my perspective that we are monitoring quantitative data and to uh, ensure that we're not only holding ourselves accountable as a central office, but also providing the support that our schools need and that that support is allocated in an equitable way. But we must too, from my perspective, also hold on to what is happening qualitatively within a school. And so there's a set of practice evidence that from our perspective that when those things are implemented well, we believe the sort of big bet is that those things will lead to improvements in academic outcomes. And so we are monitoring the work around professional learning, particularly through the regional model. We are monitoring the access that our students have and disaggregating that by groups of students to high quality materials and educational opportunities, that we're ensuring our educators and our school leaders have access to aligned professional learning. And from my perspective, one of the critical um, uh, variables to school improvement are schools that engage in problem-solving cultures. They have strong teams. They have instructional leadership teams um, where teacher leaders and educators get to set the agenda not only for the priorities of the school but also for their professional learning. That they have strong inclusion planning teams. Uh, that they're able to uh, make policy recommendations about how to create uh, inclusive environments in their schools. And so we are monitoring uh, not only the academic outcomes and the outcomes relative to culture and climate and attendance but also these sort of big bets around practices that we think will move the needle for our students. <clears throat> Every quarter we have opportunities through the work of the, the amazing regional school superintendents to have honest dialogue with each one of our school leaders around the progress that they are making on both the outcome evidence and the practice evidence. And we deploy central office leaders to work directly with school communities in areas that are mutually agreed upon by the school leader, his, her, their team, and the regional school superintendent. So I think at this point, we'll just turn it over um, back to the superintendent and to the committee for questions, knowing that some of our colleagues will help support us in some of the answers. Sounds good. Uh, I just want to commend the team. I think, um, I think to Dr. Eccleston's point, our universal expectations is a very different BPS than what certainly I experienced as a leader and I think one that we can all rally around and our leaders appreciate. Um, <clears throat> I think we see in the data as we do in the statewide data that the pandemic has had this residual impact on kids um, and it's not gonna be something that's just gonna heal overnight. It's a lot of intentionality. We can, we can set the plate with a lot of great academics um, but we also have to heal hearts and minds, and that's, I think, the work of student support. It's definitely the work within attendance. Um, you know, we are going to be doing <coughs> a campaign for attendance. 
um, <clears throat> we had um, somebody that had done it uh, in, in Cleveland come in and kind of speak to us about um, the approach. And I think it reinforced for us and all those that are working on attendance the importance of every hour that a student is in school. And every hour that that student isn't in school, you see them further and further away from recovery. And that's how we have to frame it. If they're not in school, they can't recover. Um, so <coughs> I'll open it to the, to the committee. And um, I think as Dr. Eccleson said, this was a team effort. Um, the academics team, certainly um, student support, special education, uh, English, you know, our MLE, <coughs> and also opportunity gaps, which I think um, as you see critical in the work, we are very focused on the gap work. I like this seat today where I get to go first. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation. I have data specific questions, but I guess I'll go sort of, I'll go backwards into recovery strategy, right? I think what we're talking about here is like definitely critical foundational work that as you've acknowledged is long overdue for the system. like. No argument, universal expectations, they are good. Um, but for me, it's like, it's not a recovery strategy. It's like, a, we're just setting, that's foundational work. That's like what good school systems do. Um, and so I guess for specific students who we saw sort of the most concerning trends around, low income students, um, English language learners, um, like it's clear that those students need like clear targeted support um, in addition to like high quality curriculum and mm -hmm. you know monitoring goals and good professional development all the stuff we're like we're supposed to do um, I guess like I'm curious like with those subgroups that we've seen sometimes no gains in particularly with low income students in some grade levels like what is the recovery strategy for those targeted groups? And it, like, I liked that the globe piece that maybe some of us saw like seven big ideas or whatever, and it was good. And I like that kind of thinking, but like, what is our big idea, right? Like, you know, I've have been advocating for as long as I could, like, pay students, particularly poor students, to go to school, mm -hmm. um, and you will compete even with low quality schools, <laughs> you will get butts in seats. Um, but like, what's our big idea? We had 430 million Nasser funds. Like, I, we probably have like, what, 100 million left? Sure. Like, what, what is the thing that's not just like a functioning school system, but like a recovery focused system, both? So I think yeah. the academic team can talk a bit to like the tier two interventions, and then I'm, I have a few things I wanna get in there. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, um, and as they're, um, coming up, I, I think, I see it slightly differently, although I appreciate the, the spirit of, of what you're saying. One of the things I just deeply worry about from my perspective, and so maybe it's like an, uh, it's a both and rather than a one or the other, is that all too often in Boston, some kids have not had access to high quality tier one instruction. And I've always worried as we return from the pandemic that there would be this, um, push to try to remediate learning for students and to not teach in an ambitious way and ensure that students, all students, had access to tier one instruction and that we weren't specifically monitoring <coughs> that for black students, for Latino students, for students with disabilities and multilingual learners. And so I think what the team will talk about in addition to the tier two and tier three interventions and the specificity of what those things are, we have made millions and millions of dollars of investments using ESSER dollars in high quality instructional materials and in professional learning to ramp up the tier one instruction that our students are getting access to. And we think, from our perspective, the big bet is that that is going to be game changing for many of our students. In the past, when you've walked into um, SEI classrooms, into substantially separate classrooms, those classrooms have not delivered uh, and sort of in the aggregate to the type of ambitious instruction that our students deserve. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues who might have uh, better answers on the tier two and tier three work. And I think, and just so you know, we are on the same page, like yeah. high quality <coughs> tier one instruction 
is a basic function of any American school district, right? So like I'm thinking both, like recognition, we've got to fix that mm -hmm. if that wasn't happening. Yeah. But like we're also coming out of a pandemic, so it's like fix, build the house, fix the house, but there is a recovery strategy mm -hmm. that's necessary when we're seeing when we're not seeing accelerated growth, we're like happy with the 40 to 60% growth, but like that's not gonna recover. That's gonna just sort of keep us at the same speed. But tier two, tier three. So um, we'll continue a little bit on the same line of, um, you're, you're talking about a system where a wide variety of practices were happening and many <laughs> that don't support the research in terms of, particularly in terms of how kids learn how to read and engage with grade level text. And so <coughs> that's why that commitment, um, and also in addition to that, paired with that, is really making sure that we have a strong infrastructure for multi-tiered systems of support. Again, those interventions are not um, done through sort of a remediation only in lieu of access to tier one and grade level instruction, but it is to make sure that that is there. So we have put in additional investments in reading interventionists. We also have um, put additional investments in coordinators for multi-tiered systems of support because we wanna make sure that we um, are able to track student progress because we do have a universal screener in place and we wanna make sure we know what students need and who needs more and then how to make sure we provide that. And some of that is not only through the direct materials that students receive, but also the professional learning that teachers receive. And so um, Leslie Ryan Miller, who is our Chief of Teaching and Learning, will talk a little bit more specifically around the Tier 2, Tier 3 interventions that get into the more targeted supports that students need. Good evening, everyone. Um, so just to be a little bit more specific, um, we've made considerable investments with our ESSER funds um, that support Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, so one of the big places we've invested is around online learning platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about Nearpod, Imagine Learning, um, we have a couple of others, Lexia Core 5 and Reading Horizons. So these are specific tier two or t tier three interventions that we're providing professional learning for both educators, as well as, um, as Dr. Chen said, we have a cadre of literacy interventionists that are also being trained in tier three models so that they can deliver direct support to students. And so our hope is that we're gonna learn a lot from the practices of these interventions as we think about school schedules, as we think about what the interventions are that have worked best for students. Um, so that's one of the big ones. Um, also, um, one of the things that I know is that many of our students need something different um, instead of more of the same. And so we are also um, taking advantage of some of the opportunities afforded to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, around tutoring programs, um, high leverage tutoring programs, specifically for grades four and eight, um, but there are some other opportunities for secondary students. And so we're really leaving that to schools to determine what model works best for them. There are many times uh, virtual tutoring sessions that our students have access to, but also in-person tutoring. Um, and so DESI has been very helpful in terms of partnering with our schools to figure out what works best in a particular school context. Um, and then we're working on the implementation of those pieces um, within the school. Um, as Dr. Chen said, also uh, just our MTSS coordinators, which are stipended positions, every school has access to an MTSS coordinator. Um, and this is really high leverage work in terms of working with our student support teams to really document the interventions that our students are having access to, um, checking for is this intervention working, if it's not, we need to go back and revamp and find out what interventions are gonna work for students. So that documentation is incredibly helpful and then a part that I would be remiss if I didn't share um, is supporting our educators with sharing this information with families so they understand what has been tried, what has been successful, and what's the next step if we need to look at other interventions. I would, um, I would add to that, um, thinking about the big seven ideas. Um, <clears throat> there wasn't one that I was sort of like, that's the idea. Um, I think that there were aspects of each that I think sp speaks to different groups of kids and what they need. Um, we invested in the out of school time pretty heavily. 
relative to the summers and to the vacations um, as ways of continuing to do recovery work, um, but doing it in the context of not just trying to pound more academics into kids, but to thread it in a way that they engage and through the engagement they learn. Um, for our multilingual learners, that can be access to um, being with peers um, who are speaking the same language or being out um, you know, in the community where they're learning language. Uh, in addition to you know um, other kinds of deve language development uh, for um, special education students, we expanded a lot of the out of school time over the summer um, relative to have additional inclusion seats. And I would see us continuing to do that because I think that's an that's that eight week period where we see a lot of regression, um, and that's an opportunity to actually close. Um, I also think, and as I'm going to ask Chief Kelton um, to come up because I think. Uh, what we're also doing is working across the aisle of academics and student support mm. to recognize that there's a place within student support um, so that there's a number of initiatives that I think are actually key to the recovery. So for instance, we just launched Reach 1000 around mentoring um, with the goal of 1,000 young people getting mentored and in that process making a connection, building a relationship, talking about school, talking about career, talking about uh, college. That's a form of recovery, right, of that kind of deep re-engagement. We've worked um, quite a bit with the Juice Foundation, Jalen Brown's foundation, which has gotten into STEM, and a lot of work um, that happened. I'm not going to steal your thunder. You've got Don't plenty that you can talk about. <laughs> but um, point being that I think um, the more we can expand the menu for our young people, recognizing they all need something slightly different, um, then the more likelihood they all get something. I think what's missing that we'll want to build on at some point soon is is really the, I the idea or the ability to do individualized success plans, right? Which in essence is like, is really the heart of inclusive learning that you account for every student, be it gen education, special education, multilingual learner, and you understand what goals that student's trying to make in a variety of areas and you're matching the programming to that. And so I think that is going to be a way we, we can sort of move forward as a system that's more systematic. Um, at the high school level, we call that, uh, you know, portfolio work or capstone work, right? Like we have terms for it, but not necessarily at the other grades. But I think that's worth us exploring as a district to be able to really document it. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that, um, the other thing that I think about is, you know, part of, the, part of the issue the last couple of years, and there's always this mismatch with money, <laughs> um, not, not complaining that money comes, but when money came, the students weren't ready for it. They weren't ready for what we gave, what we had to give. Um, and so it's taken a couple of years for the students to come back, for us to be able to reattach and students and staff to identify how to be able to fill the gap for students. It's just now really starting to happen. So it's difficult that ESSER dollars are sort of ending, um, and, and it is what it is, but we need to, as a system and, and as a state, find ways to continue some of that funding because the recovery isn't over. Um, and that's, you know, that's gonna be, I think, a, a s needs to be a statewide conversation about that. But I think for us, it really is building this menu. And then in the student support department, to just talk about just a few of the things that are, you know, you guys have so much going on that I just think really is reinforcing the great work that academics is doing. Yeah, I think what is really at the heart of this work is relationship building, is really understanding that all of our students are unique, that their needs are unique, and that in order to create a successful path for them, the conversation has to include the student, the family, and community members. So this really has to be a village approach um, to getting our students to where they need. Um, I think the pandemic has also really put a light on student support in a way that it wasn't before. Um, you know, schools are institutional academic settings. That's what they are. And we know that teaching and learning and curriculum and instruction has always been at the forefront. But now we're seeing and understanding that the mental health needs, that the social emotional needs of our young people really have to come first. We have to 
really understand that hierarchy of needs and put the right supports in. So we've expanded in so many ways in the division of student support. We've added regional supervisors of attendance to every region, um, restorative practices, safe and welcoming school specialists to every region, really getting down and helping schools to do the work of understanding the needs of their students and meeting those social emotional needs before we ask them to sit down and learn the lesson that we're giving to them. I'm out of time. You're out of time. Yeah. I can do five, my five minutes. <laughs> if you'd like to, yeah, you're welcome good. to use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I. You want? Um, to have any specific questions? I do. I. You do. Go oh, go. Oh, go, perfect. Go, then I have in. two questions. I still am curious, not just about like the big shiny idea, but like. I am struggling to differentiate, and this came up when we were talking about the budget and and thinking about the fiscal cliff we're about to experience. Um, it f it just feels like we're we're at this place where we're like building the makings of like what a school system should be, and not sti I'm still not hearing the thing that accelerates progress. I mean, we have schools where based on data, everyone is in a tier two or tier three intervention, right? Like we have a school with zero proficiency. So the, everything is an intervention. And I just, I guess I'm just struggling to see that. Um, and maybe it's coming, maybe it is just about like a bigger menu but I'm like, I don't know, this was like this really cool opportunity to potentially revolutionize how we think about education. It just feels like, and I had this issue before, like we're just investing in the things we were supposed to be investing in all along. So I think in, I think there is some truth to that, right? That you know, the best way to not have a gap is to not create one. And so I think that there's certainly, I think what the team was sort of illustrating is Going forward, that is one of the goals, is to really focus on Tier 1 and on TMSS, just so that we don't continue to, to create the gaps. Certainly all the dollars that are being invested in pre-K, right, all the way back to three-year-olds, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, that, that's the point. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, at the, at the college and career, and expanding ed options as a way to meet the needs of young people. The difficulty with the pandemic is you can't intervene your way out of it. Right, like, and I, I think like that's where it really is thinking about the kids that are in, in the schools and then what is the menu that makes sense. So small group instruction can be a really effective tier two practice, yep. um, but it can also not be, <laughs> right? So I think <clears throat> everything that we're trying to do is to bring quality both in what we're, we're using for materials, but then also in how we're, how we're teaching them. And so, that in and of itself is different, and that in and of itself will have impact in addition to reading intervention, right, for certain groups of students, um, or math intervention, or, um, you know, uh, thinking about like our SLIFE curriculum um, and how we're approaching SLIFE. So really looking, uh, because I would say the, our group of SLIFE students are that group that needs the extra interventions within the MLE uh, world. And so I think for us, we're really trying to partner with the principals to bring to them a menu that makes sense in their schools to deliver those tier twos and tier threes. And recognize that in some cases, we have to go over and above that. So whether that's bringing in the research-based programming in the after school hours or in the summers, um, or you know that's holding curriculum nights with families so that there's an extension of learning at home. I think those are the other pieces that they're not the wow, but all together they actually are impactful. The, I guess the last question I have here, um, at what point in our analysis of the data are we going to make decisions around a school not showing sufficient growth year over year? So I'm not even talking about like proficiency because everyone's coming in at a different place, right? Like I'm talking about 
meeting the 40 to 60 percent average year growth right just to keep on track not accelerating you're not jumping multiple grade levels right like at what year do we start having conversations about schools that are not making that type of growth year over year and no longer perpetuating those outcomes for families within the system are you talking about closing those schools i'm talking about yeah or new options for families i'm yeah yeah i think it's the it's the not fun part about the work yeah. but like when is it no longer particularly as and for me there's a different urgency in recovery right because uh, we've lost so much time, the gaps have widened in so many places. Like, when do we start really saying, like, this is not showing, and the kids are not growing there? Yeah. So I think I think um, I would say two things, and feel free anyone on the team to chime in. But um, <clears throat> I think one is that as we walk down the road, using all the data points to talk about conversions and closures, certainly outcomes, academic outcomes, have to be part of that conversation. I think the second thing I would say is, I think the team's expansion of the catchment from 10% to 20% is really important. Mm. Because it, it is a, in some ways, an insulator so that more schools don't keep sinking. You know, we, t we tend to wait to respond w until there's a fire. And I think the team's trying to get ahead of that and say, listen, if we've got a couple years data that's showing we're going in the wrong direction, there was a slide in here actually of several schools that have a multi-year trend, we know we have to get into those schools and we need to start doing the same intervention before it takes the state to say that's a transformation school. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll just add that I think one of the things we have not had in the past is a, is a system level performance management framework, right? Um, we haven't been clear on what we expect from schools. We haven't um, been clear on like what are the metrics that we're using to define success and progress. We haven't had our eye in a system level way uh, around whether or not over time, over a short period of time, there's evidence or non-evidence of progress um, toward those metrics. And I think for the first time we've been implementing um, quarterly reviews where we are looking in a very systematic way at every school in the system and looking for evidence or non-evidence of um, of progress toward those things. And when we don't see the level of progress that we expect, we, we're nimble enough now as an organization, we have the resources embedded within, within the regional support model to deploy those supports to schools so that this is a system that's built on both support and accountability mm -hmm. for not only the schoolhouse but also for the central office. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I want to start off by saying, if we're a truly a student outcome focused governance board, mm -hmm. this is probably one of the most important presentations of the year, mm -hmm. right? Because this is showing us our student outcomes. And from that, we can have the discussions about what should be done. Mm -hmm. And along with several other presentations we get during the year, but we spend a lot of time on other stuff. This is student outcomes, right? And by the way, I do want to call out the fact that under the state accountability systems, Boston is defined as not requiring assistance or intervention because we have made substantial progress towards targets, which puts us at the top 51% of districts in the state. Do I read that properly? No. No? It's that we've met 51% of those improvement targets that are set out by the state. Oh, I was referring to that. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's a table in the presentation. Sorry. I think vice chairs. I think vice chairs looking at the fact that we fall within the 142 41. schools. Yes. But when you look at across all schools, that kind of puts it in the top, the 50 percent. Yeah, I was I was adding together those that are meeting or exceeding targets, which is 15.6 percent of Massachusetts districts, or substantial progress to targets, which is 35.7 percent districts. You add those together, that's 51. Point so we are in the top 51.3% of districts statewide under the state accountability system. That's not something people would typically pick out when they hear how Boston is doing. So I just wanted to call that out. Having said that, a lot of information here, we can be doing a lot better, right? And I always thought job one was literacy for our students because if our students can't read or write, they can't be learning all the other subjects and they can't progress. 
and it pains me when I talk to s high school leaders and they tell me that they have students coming to them from K to 6 who can't read or write because they've just been promoted during the years. But we know from this data we have students that struggle with that. So I always thought literacy was job one, and I look forward to having a conversation about how equitable, equitable literacy is doing and you know what the obstacles are and what the successes are and what we can do to continue to improve that. But this report really highlights um, attendance is job one having our students in a classroom and staying in a classroom, having engaging curriculum and engaging teachers and engaging environments that they want to continue to be there. If our students aren't there, they're not learning. And our, rapid, our achievement gaps are widening because of that. And you put it in very stark terms with those charts. So to me, if, and this is just my own personal opinion, if attendance is job one, then the sense of urgency has to be around that. And I know we've had previous presentations about attendance and what's going on about that, and particularly at the schools of focus, the work that's being done. And we have seen some promising signs there. But I also have to say in the, in the page, and I, and I should have had it turned to it. I apologize that I didn't. Um, the work that's going to be done, Mr. Cardato Hernandez, you just kind of referenced it. The strong correlation between performance and attendance indicates being back in school matters. So schools will, on a quarterly basis, review their chronic absenteeism targets, which are aligned to state accountability targets. That does not scream sense of urgency to me. It does not scream a Marshall plan to figure out every, and I was encouraged, Superintendent, when you talked about like ideas we're learning from Cleveland and stuff like that. But we need a, we need a Marshall plan. Right. So I think, um, through chair. So I think that. Sorry for the old history. No, 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 that's okay. I, I think that that particular quote is in there as a change reference from what we were previously doing. But there is an entire initiative around attendance. Um, Chief Kelton, do you want to just talk a little bit about the work that we're doing that I think actually has put us on trajectory, right, to start addressing chronic absenteeism? Right. So chronic absenteeism is something that we're visiting every week with our schools. So our supervisors of attendance are helping our schools build capacity to look at that data, to understand that data, and then to implement the correct <coughs> supports to put that data in a place where we want it to be. Um, we have to put a focus on creating sustainable attendance teams in every single school. And that's what our supervisors of attendance are charged with this year, mm -hmm. is helping schools create those systems have those meetings and have those meetings have tangible supports that we can put in place for students and families to understand what it is that they need in order to start coming to school every single day. Yeah. So the data is constantly being looked at, but there's, there's teams and one of the things that um, w I was very proud about as we were listening to um, the keynote from Cleveland, and she was sort of talking about best practice of attendance initiative, <coughs> we're, we're there. Like most of the things that we're doing, including the rebuilding of the student support teams to include the nurse, to include the social worker, right? To include the family liaison. Like there's things that we're doing that um, get missed in other places and really matter to address. Because like, I'll give you for instance, when the mayor and I were doing the door knocks, um, you know, out the first week, mm -hmm. of, um, first week of school, we went to three kids, all of whom were chronically absent, and um, in two of the cases, there was an underlying medical issue. So you have to have the nurse part of the conversation, right? In, an you know, in another case, the, the, I love this kid too, the kid, was <laughs> the kid was just very flat up and said, listen, I'm not gonna go back to school in the way you think. Mm. And I said, do you wanna get a diploma? And she said, yeah but I'm not going back into a building. Like, she had, what she had experienced, she just didn't feel a sense of connection and safety to the physical school. But she wanted, she said, I wanna be in healthcare. I wanna be a nurse. Like, she had a sense and a perspective of her future, but the way we were presenting it wasn't her way. That's where Adoptions comes in. That's the reason we're investing so much right now to expand out a lot of alternative options for kids 
so that, you know, so we made a connection so that she could now do some distance learning and an internship and go to a college class. Great. Like, now she's reengaged. Like, we just have to think out of the box, right, in those ways. And you have to have a team that can actually pull the levers on all the different right. opportunities for the kids. Um, thank you for that. And you and I have had long conversations about all the ed and the value, and we have yep. to have many arrows in the quiver for our students to choose from. Let's, can we talk for a little bit about equitable literacy? Love to hear thoughts on how it's what one full year of implementation. Um, Dr. Chen is probably going to chat about this. Could you just give us your thoughts about, you know, our main literacy program curriculum, how it's going? Sure. Some um, highlights and some challenges. I think number one. Um, it is also really important that the district has been sticking with the strategy. Often what we've done is dream up something new every other year and abandon and keep moving. And it's been really, um, it's been difficult for schools to just figure out what the new strategy is, is every other year. And so, and it takes time. So when we talk about equitable literacy, it is certainly including about reading and evidence-based reading, especially in the early grades, but is really about teaching at grade level and all content area through the lens of being literate, being able to be well-versed in every content area. And so that kind of work, so you've heard us talk about the, the really uncomfortable reality that all our schools have not been teaching all of our students at grade level. It's very common sense, right? If you don't ever have access as a student to grade level learning, there's no possible way for you to achieve and, be, and demonstrate proficiency because you've just simply never been given the chance. And unfortunately, that is, has had been the history in so many of our schools. Now, it comes from, in many ways, some well-intentioned reasons of students maybe not yet performing at grade level and a, and a tendency to want to give them something lower so they can feel successful. But we've had to really push, and, and I would also say this is a team effort across the system. Um, we've talked about our opportunity achievement gap policy. It really is about making sure we center the identities of our students and making sure we see the possibility and therefore we don't hold them back or keep them from grade level instruction. So there's, there's a, certainly a mindset and high expectations for our students and getting to know them, building those relationships, as Chief Kelton said, that, that is very paramount. Those are not insignificant things. But at the same time, they also need to have high quality instructional materials in front of them. So what I would say we did last year was really getting folks up to speed on what should every student be getting. And as we started to work on this, Every month with schools, every school leader would come together. We would go into classrooms to look at what are kids doing? Are they doing grade level work? We also really were very clear, um, Dr. Eccleson mentioned earlier that we've had sort of a, a million flowers bloom and certainly that was what I encountered the last time I was in the VPS as well. And they really needed access to those high quality materials. So um, that is something that we put investments in and, and we're very proud to say we put up an expectation and we followed through, um, and the schools appreciate it because sometimes we give them an ex expectation and then we don't give them the resources to, to be able to pull it off. Um, so that is also part of what's working well in our equitable literacy. Now, to be candid, when we look at these results, which are very sobering, we may say, well, what happened? And I think change takes some time. Now, I'm not saying we're looking for a 10-year runway here, but when we've asked people to teach in very different ways than they have taught for many years, mm -hmm. when many of our schools held on to practices that were not supported by their research and the evidence, particularly in how kids learn to read, that is a huge shift. Um, and that's what we've been, um, sometimes the superintendent talks about sort of turning this, this big ship, and we're turning it, um, and we want to do it with greater urgency, but now people have the materials. And I do want to ask um, Leslie to talk a little bit about that lift, because it's been quite a lift, and it's also been a very good use of our ESSER money and, and resources as well. 
And as you prepare to talk about that, I just, if you could also address, you know, we have 40% of our schools that have some level of autonomy, right? So has that been a challenge to have schools that are more autonomous saying, oh, no, no, we're fine. We pick our own curriculum. Sure. So that's a great question. So I think one example um, of just this lift um, is that we spent the spring really procuring high quality instructional materials. We had 75 schools opt in to using high quality instructional materials. So that begs the question of what was being used prior. So now we've procured those materials and the teaching and learning team, program directors, equitable literacy coaches, we all have a common goal across teaching and learning um, that our focus is on the implementation of these high quality instructional materials. So they can't be in boxes, they need to be in the hands of students, in the hands of teachers, and they need to be used with fidelity and appropriately. Um, and so we've even gone as far as um, we've contracted um, with some uh, various groups that are supporting the implementation of these materials that just give us more capacity and give schools really the day-to-day -day support that they might need in addition um, to equitable literacy coaching. Um, I just want to share, I was at uh, Young Achievers yesterday. Uh, actually, no, that was, was that yesterday? That was yesterday. Um, <laughs> at Young Achievers, and they just adopted uh, illustrative math. And to go into, we went into 11 classrooms, and in all 11 classrooms, uh, to look at the math instruction, they were all using the newly procured highly high quality instructional materials, and they were all on the appropriate scope and sequence. Um, and so it was just uh, really a joyous moment to see all that work come to fruition and to see that teachers are valuing the materials and really working hard um, to implement them. It's not an easy lift. It's a real change in practice, and they need to get familiar with those materials. So, so you said, excuse me, 75 schools so I hear that, and I hear 40 schools didn't. So that what were means, they doing? yep, so that means some schools may have already had the high quality instructional materials that they may have been using. Um, but then we also did give schools an option um, of using materials that are rated as high quality on ed reports or curate, but they also have to take those materials through a racial <coughs> equity planning tool that will then be vetted by all of the program directors in teaching and learning. And those racial equity planning tools are actually due uh, November 15th, and so we're just supporting schools with that process. Okay. So that is, um, you know, we did give schools an option, um, but that doesn't mean that those materials will be approved. We really need to know that they've engaged the community, that they've looked at their data, and that they're uh, implementing materials that are standards aligned, uh, grade level aligned, um, as, free as, bias, as free of bias and racism as possible. Um, and that they're doing that work and have a professional learning plan for their teachers, right? So one of the things that we're learning is that um, it really comes down to implementation at the end of the day. That's where the rubber yeah. hits the road. So Dr. Chen, you, thank you for that. Uh, you talked about turning the ship, right? And it, it takes a while. Now you've, we've had a year at it and we've gotten the materials and the professional development and the coaches, et cetera. Do you believe we're gonna start to see changes this year in results? I do. I do <coughs> believe, um, and, and I would want to note also that we have ESL curriculum as well yeah. for our multilingual learners. Um, and, and I will say the industry has not been very well prepared for ESL materials. And so our teams have actually been writing that. We've sought out a lot of experts and reached out to folks who we have district um, approved for instance, English language arts materials, and there were no corollary sort of up-to-date ESL materials from any of those publishers that we use. So our team actually had to create their own. Uh, I and I do think there would be, you know, to, to answer your question, an uptick here because um, part of this process, while it may feel slow, is, um, and certainly in my experience in this work, you can mandate people to do things, but that actually won't take hold in them unless they have ownership right. around the work. And I do think in the last year, two years, we've developed that ownership with school leaders because we've shown them and worked alongside them 
to create that compelling desire to want to do that. And part of that is research-based work around working with teams. So it was, it's not about we tell the principal to do it and then the principal tells the teachers to do it. We really work alongside educators. And I think that is why I believe we will see change because it's not just something from a top down. Yes, we were very clear about our expectations. However, we really worked with school leaders to cultivate teams to want to do this as well. And that is a big part of the change as well. Great, thank you. And just to your last point, and then I'll stop, Chair. Um, uh, you mentioned about the uh, difficulty in getting high quality ESL materials. I assume you're aware of the consortium of districts that work together to kind of put an open RFP to publishers to develop materials very specific. It was led by LA and a few other districts joined in and they, uh, if you're aware of this, I'll stop. <coughs> but I don't know if you looked at those materials and if that's what we're using. We, um, there for, for one example is um, expeditionary learning, which is um, a highly rated um, curriculum. And there were some other folks in the consortium that worked with them. Oakland Unified was one that worked specifically with that particular vendor. And we actually met with them as well. And they said, listen, we're, you know, we're still like two years out. And we said, listen, we need it now. We needed it yesterday. And so we did meet with them to have them check some of our work as well. And we're also working with um, another um, English Learner Success Forum, I think I'm gonna say the name right. Um, that, is a, that is a partner that has worked with some of the consortium schools as well. And so we, when we say to our schools, our curriculum needs to be vetted, it also include, includes district-created curriculum. So mm -hmm. that's why we are having that organization vet the work that we're doing with the ESL materials. Um, because it's not just, sort of, it, and while it's great to have the educator engagement in it, but we want to make sure we have high quality materials. Um, so that also includes some work that um, certainly Leslie's leading in, in getting our focus materials reviewed as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Madam Chair, I'm done. Uh, it's okay. I only, I only have one question um, tonight, but we'll talk more about it. <coughs> I'm thinking about what happens to me as a teacher. Year after year, we get the MCAS results back. How am I using the information, or am I given information to understand year after year how my students are doing? Do I understand the places that I'm teaching and they are doing well in, or the places that I'm weak? Because my question is, how can I understand what my impact I'm having when I then look at the scores that are not moving? And I know that the district has put a lot of effort into support, but what is that? How does that speak to me, the teacher, not just the school leader or the school? Yeah, so that was one of the slides that Dr. Eccleson showed with the MCAS dashboard. So this year we were able to get that out the first week of June, and so for ELA, that's you know three months after the students have tested. Um, teachers had their item level data compared to the district, compared to the state. They could look at the released items to see what those items were. They could look at how that compares to those different points and then also what that looks like for the different learning standards. And so they had multiple ways through the dashboard to analyze their data and look at performance. Throughout the spring and the summer, we continued to update the dashboard as we got refreshes mm -hmm. of the data from DESE to the point that by the fall, we were able to give teachers in the dashboard access to both the MCAS performance for last year's students, so their SY22-23 students, they could see how they performed on the MCAS, and they could also see the new students that are in front of them for 23-24, how they performed last year, and what some of their learning needs were. And so we were very proud that we were able to get them more than just like the raw data that the state shares, but also get them to see what that looks like for each of their classes that they taught, and um, what that looked like compared to the district as well. Mm -hmm. But, but then again, where does the accountability go, come from in terms of, okay, I have the information, I'm doing some things different, but I'm still trying to figure out where the urgency and the push is that will get us looking at, the, you know, how do I as a teacher say, you know, I'm looking at this, something I'm not doing or I need more help X, Y, and Z, where does that? 
So there are a few different ways. One is Dr. Eccleston um, shared earlier about the quarterly progress reviews that each of the school um, engages in. Mm -hmm. And so they'll look at, at the standards level, the MCAS data that, that April just mentioned. And then there are also screeners throughout the year, three times a year, where they can also check to what degree is their progress on those standards. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's not just about that screener, but there's also curriculum embedded assessments and student work that they would always be looking at throughout the year, and the principal can see that. Mm -hmm. So we use the screener mostly just to look at progress monitoring and then no, determining which students need more when we were speaking about the tier two and tier three interventions. So there is this close look, if you will, that the school has and also um, the regional staff as well and the regional school superintendent. Did you want to talk about the teams? Sure. I, I would just add briefly, um, there's a real focus with the universal expectations around teaming. And so really using ILTs, common planning times, um, to ensure that we're bringing educators together to talk about mm -hmm. the work and talk about strategies to um, enhance the work. And this is something that's really been leveraged by the regional model. I'd say certainly in teaching and learning, but also in April shop and ODA, um, directors, program directors, coaches are really supporting capacity building at the team level. So how do we support individual grade level teams to have a leader that can run an effective common planning time that's asking the tough questions of teachers, that's supporting them to look at student work? Um, we certainly see this as a high leverage strategy. Mm -hmm. So how long have we been implementing this, these strategies? Sure, so just in terms of using common planning times? No, and just any of the ones that are going to help teachers improve their practice. So when, when you say strategies, particular learning strategies, or just the strategy of teaming? I guess, oh, I guess. I, got it. I think the, the, the real question is, with all of these inputs and supports and this ability, we're still not seeing things moving. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out what are we missing yeah. that even if we're putting forth all of these efforts yeah. that we're still not seeing the scores indicate the efforts. I think it's worth noting the universal expectations that Dr. Eccleston <coughs> mentioned earlier where there are outcomes that we're tracking through MCAS access, um, mm -hmm. our universal screening data, and then there are those practices, because if you just track the outcomes and then you don't look at what's leading to them and monitoring those, that's also a, a, a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so Leslie talked a little bit about how teams look at student work and data together and plan accordingly. We mm -hmm. also started a practice just last year where we have, um, we call it a, an equitable literacy walkthrough tool where mm -hmm. we have indicators for school leaders and there are schools that actually teachers use them with each other as mm -hmm. well as a school team where they're looking at what are the practices and largely it's focused on what is the level of work the students are doing. Are the students looking at um, actually engaged in texts that are at their grade level, engaged in science or math problems that are at their grade level. Mm -hmm. And then to what degree are we differentiating? So this year we're going deeper to say, if, it's a, if a student is an English language learner and at a particular ELD level, what is the kind of work that's happening to give them access to that same mm -hmm. grade level task? Or if there are particular students with disabilities, what is the specially designed instruction that's giving that student access? So mm -hmm. we're deepening that practice. We started that last year, okay. and it built over time, and, and that I think will help enable us to catch, and not just wait for the next year's MCAS, but what are the things that we're doing in between and tracking. So it's a combination of the practices mm -hmm. and then the outcomes that we're tracking on a quarterly basis. I would say a couple things. And so, as you all know, the district has just changed and gone through a lot over the past four years thinking about the pandemic and like what supports look like and so this has been a phased in approach and it has looked different like year over year so we are working on the regional model and so for example the regional liaisons within the office of data and accountability are our accelerated inquiry and improvement managers 
They have a variety of supports that they're able to um, provide to schools. They work primarily with our transformation schools, which we've seen some really good movement in some of those transformation schools as well. They offer um, supports to these critical teaming structures around ILTs and CPTs. They, offer, they also offer broader ranged professional development opportunities around weekly data meetings and how teachers and um, admins within schools can run those meetings where they're constantly looking at student um, work and looking at the data to understand what are the standards, what are the areas that they need to really improve mm -hmm. instruction. So, um, so at the regional level, our AIM team, they're working primarily with transformation schools, but we also have other liaisons within the regional model and the mm -hmm. liaisons are somewhat oriented towards the three priorities within the quality school plan. So we have pri primary liaisons that support equitable literacy. AIMS are one of them, but not the only one. And so they are able to provide mm -hmm. the non-transformation schools and other schools with these um, integrated data-informed um, coaching strategies and practices. No, so it's been evolving over the past. Yeah, no, I appreciate all years. the efforts, but <laughs> I still have my baseline question. And I mean, that's something that we can talk more about, but I guess I'm really trying to understand on the teacher level, you know, where do they see their responsibility as, as in terms of taking advantage of all these and where are they calling the crisis or the urgency when they see it in their own data or after all of these in supports that kids still aren't making the progress. And so that's what I, you know, I understand and I absolutely appreciate all the efforts, but it's the urgency of, you know, things, and I get it, if, if, if we're only looking at it right now from a two-year changeover into a process, so it means we do need time to wait. But as we know from our data, this has been going on for a very long time, so that's it. So I do want to thank you all, and I know that we have much, much, much work to get all of this up to speed so we can begin to see this, these changes. Um, so thank you, and we look forward to continuing this conversation um, as we move forward. Um, we'll now move on to public comment on reports. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers. Okay, thank you. Um, any new business? I love that you looked at new business is my favorite time. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> just a quick new business question. Can we get an update? on the bus drivers or the bus monitors the were they monitors today who came yeah. uh and spoke about that and this is not the first time we've heard it the sort of 19 dollars versus 24 so like what's the sort of there there and maybe the clarity that we're offering to the field and then um and then obviously the payroll issues and folks not getting paid uh, through your chair so um I can I can have OHC uh, report out, but this is really um, a, a different understanding within the unit of the contract that was bargained. Yep. And so it really isn't uh, individual payroll issues. Okay. Um, and we we confirmed that earlier. So, um, but I, I you know I, I can have um, OHC if is I don't think Francis is still here, but I can Sam. Do you want to Deputy Depina? just so that we can clear it. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, the short, quick answer is that we've uh, modified the pay rate and structure for the bus monitors unit because we um, worked uh, over the last couple of years understanding that they were one of our lowest um, uh, wage earners in the district, and given the work that they did, it was just unreasonable at the rate that they were getting. So we moved from a rate of uh, getting paid by the route to an hourly rate, which was significantly higher than they would have earned by just doing certain routes because the routes that they were working sometimes were real shorter. It didn't allow them opportunity to get health benefits. So in the, new, in the recent contract negotiations, we upgraded the rate, allowed them to get paid hourly. We changed the structure by which they get paid because before they were getting they had to sign into schools. It was a real convoluted process, but now we have a streamlined process where they tap it on the bus. It's easily to track and monitor. We manage it centrally versus schools doing it. So we cleaned up the whole process. So um, it's just a misunderstanding of the rate hourly versus by the um, actual route that they were doing. And is it f maybe is there something we can do for those folks who are still here who are like feeling or, or 
and maybe in some cases experiencing a, a decrease in their biweekly earnings. Sure. The team has been working with the union real closely okay. to make sure the, um, they were uh, collectively communicating the new changes and continue to educate folks on the changes, and, and that's been the plan. Copy. Yeah, it, we, we really are working, it, it, and it's it's very easy to understand why there's a misunderstanding, <clears throat> because it at day's end you you look at the bottom line of your paycheck, um, but <clears throat> we are definitely working, and so it isn't a payroll issue. It is it is the restructuring of the contract. For whatever it's worth, we all know like water cooler chatter happens everywhere, even if there's no water cooler. So maybe the folks who came tonight, we just circle back with to help. Even the, if Absolutely. that conversation's happening with the collective bargaining unit, sure. they're having that conversation with us, too. It's like, we see you, we know, let's help you clarify. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anything else? And that concludes our business for this evening. Tomorrow, Thursday, October 5th at 6 p.m., the committee will hold an in-person retreat on the sixth floor of this building. The session will be facilitated by Dr. Ray Hart, Executive Director of the Council of Great City Schools. The retreat will give members an opportunity to reconnect, position us for a successful school year. The retreat will not be broadcast, but it will be open to the public. And so we'll look forward to seeing members tomorrow night. Um, the next hybrid school committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, October 18th at 6 p.m. at the Bowling Building. There's nothing further. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So Is moved. there a motion? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or objection to the mo motion? Is there any objection to approving the motion by unanimous consent? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all and have a good night. Oh, oh, we'll be right back here. See you soon. Tomorrow.